deserves that. Is that the name of the title? Is that the title of it? Okay. I'd like to call this hearing to order and to uh, welcome our witnesses and our guests. This is a legislative hearing uh, on H.R. 4660. None of our witnesses will be sworn in. It's a joint hearing with the Subcommittee on Civil Service and Agency Organization with Dr. David Weldon. And uh, he and I will be chairing this hearing. This is a hearing that we have been eager to have, and uh, we're on our way. And this morning, we will hear from six members of Congress, four from the House and two from the Senate, we are going to disperse with the opening statements of the members uh, until our legislative colleagues have made their statements and responded to our questions. Then we will have our statements before Warren Rudman, who has appeared before this committee on a number of occasions about this very issue, combating terrorism, improving the federal response, the reorganization of our government to do that. And we have before us the Honorable Mac Thornberry, the Honorable Jane Harmon, the Honorable Jim Gimmitz, the Honorable Ellen Tauscher, uh, the Honorable Joseph Lieberman, my colleague from Connecticut, the Honorable Arlen Specter, the U.S. How uh, uh, as well, our two Senate colleagues. If we could show, close the doors, that would be helpful. And what we are going to do is we're going to have opening statements from our colleagues. This is not perfunctory. Uh, they're not in and out. Uh, our colleagues will be responding to our questions. They have thought long and hard on this issue. They are experts on reorganization, and uh, we are eager to get their input. And we're just going to go down the row. Uh, Mr. Uh, Representative Thornberry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for having me back. I remember very well in April 2001 appearing before your subcommittee to talk about this very issue. Uh, you and members of, of, of this committee have, have really been out in the forefront in recognizing that we live in a different, in some ways more dangerous world, and that we have to reform government in order to meet those dangers and meet those challenges. And so I, I commend you and the members of this committee on, on your leadership. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I would ask that my complete statement be made part of the record, uh, and I will, would like to summarize uh, without going through a lot of the history. Where we are is that the uh, President has made a bold and, I think, well-considered proposal and the ball is, is now in, in Congress's court. Um, I have to admit that I've been working on this for about a year and a half, but I think the President's proposal is better than the bills that I've introduced. And uh, it really advances, uh, advances the thought. Let me make just a few points, and then I most eagerly uh, would like to respond to your questions and comments. First point I would like to make is that this proposal is well studied. There, there's some critics who seem to, to infer that this was four people in the middle of the night who all of a sudden came out with uh, something. It, the origins, as far as I know, go back to the Hart-Rudman Commission. Uh, and you'll hear from Senator Rudman in a moment, but I think it's important for us to remember that in 1997, we in Congress passed into law uh, authorization for this commission to look at the broad range of security challenges over the next 20 and 30 years. And on this commission were some of the most prominent experienced Americans in issues of national security. In addition to Senators Rudman and Hart and our former colleague Speaker Gingrich and our former colleague Lee Hamilton, it included people like Ann Armstrong, former counselor to the president, ambassador to Great Britain, Norm Augustine, chairman of Lockheed Martin, John Galvin, uh, the uh, former uh, 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 sink in, in, in Europe, uh, Leslie Gell, president of the Council of Foreign Relations, Jim Schlesinger, secretary of defense and energy, uh, ambassador Andrew Young from, from the UN, and, and the others were just as prestigious. They spent three years studying the broad range of national security issues. They said the number one vulnerability we've got is homeland security. And they said what we need to do is create a department of homeland security. And they made the proposal. I introduced the bill uh, in March 2001. And we've spent uh, 
you have spent time since then having hearings. Senator Lieberman's committee has had a number of hearings. The point is there's lots of work that has gone on into this proposal before now, and, and it is well studied. We've got to get the details right, but a lot of background work has been done. Second point I want to make is that the need for this kind of reorganization, I think, is beyond question. I've been listening carefully to the comments made since the president's proposal and before. I don't hear anyone saying, no, I'm satisfied with the current system. We can just rest with what we have and trust the security of our people to the current structures. Everybody agrees we've got to make changes. Everybody agrees a hundred different agencies scattered around the government is unacceptable. They can't be coordinated. They don't have the right focus. Homeland Security is not the kind of priority that it needs to be. And even the best efforts of Governor Ridge and a hundred people in the White House cannot solve that problem. We Everybody agrees that, that organization is needed, that it doesn't solve all the problems, but we must act. Third point I want to make is that we must act, but this does not, this cannot and should not try to solve all of the problems with Homeland Security. I get a little frustrated with people who argue, well, this doesn't solve all the problems the FBI has. Well, what about the CIA difficulties? You cannot pass one bill that solves everything. What you can do is try to bring together different uh, organizations that have a similar mission, make sure they're coordinated, have a similar focus, uh, and, and my colleagues, uh, some of my colleagues on the table are working with the Intelligence Committee to sort through some of those issues. Uh, there, maybe we need to do something on, on the FBI, but that, we can't do everything in this bill, but that should not stop us from doing what we can. And sometimes I'm afraid that some of these uh, excuses or things that this bill does not solve is really an excuse for inaction, and I think we have to be careful about that. Last point I'd like to make, Mr. Chairman, is that we must act, and we must act quickly. As I say, the ball is in our court. I believe that uh, uh, Minority Leader Gephardt's call to have this passed by September 11th is right and good, and that ought to be our goal. Uh, from the very beginning of this effort, this has been bipartisan in the Congress. My colleagues here uh, at the table with me, I believe, have no differences of opinion. We have worked uh, together every step of the way, and we have been bicameral as well. Uh, with Senator Lieberman, Inspector, and Graham, we have worked language together. We have, have, have tried to make sure that it's, it's uh, as good as we can get it. And, and there's no reason in the world we should not continue to be bipartisan and, and bicameral. Uh, but we have, there will be opponents, and we have to be wary of those people who find excuses why this cannot happen. Mr. Chairman, all of us woke up today with headlines in the Post about yet another attack against our country, which we have successfully stopped, thank goodness. Uh, but this is what's at stake. This kind of attack using chemical, biological, nuclear weapons, radiological weapons, uh, or some other kinds of suicide bombers they've, uh, of the kind we've seen. We must act quickly. Delay in passing this bill helps the terrorists because it means we are unprepared that much longer. Uh, so I want to urge that while we're careful, do it right, we must also act promptly. The ball's in our court, and history will be judging us on our actions. Thank you, uh, Representative Arnberry. Representative Harmon, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman uh, and Chairman Weldon for uh, holding what I believe is the first hearing on a structure for Homeland Security since the administration unveiled its ambitious and bold proposal last Thursday. Uh, to you, Chairman Shays, I just congratulate you for a big year. Uh, your name was on the campaign finance proposal that we finally passed uh, recently, and I think you are one of the leaders in this House, along with uh, many of us uh, sitting before you, on this issue as well. And you might get uh, two goals this year. That's really big, and it's a, it's, it's a comment on your extraordinary talent and leadership, and I just commend you for that. Um, Mr. Chairman, or Mr. Chairman, uh, we must remain focused on our goal, which is to prevent 
further terrorist attacks. As we talk about this legislation, the, the legislation pending before your committee, and the new proposal by the administration, let's stay focused on the goal to prevent further terrorist attacks. As uh, Representative Thornberry just uh, mentioned, uh, we had a great victory yesterday. The CIA and, and FBI worked closely together to prevent a, a to stop, disrupt, and 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 take apart a plot, uh, perhaps to uh, 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 unleash a radiological bomb uh, against our citizens. Uh, but we cannot be complacent that that's the only plot that's out there. There may be more. And until we have a strategy and a coordinated means to prevent and disrupt these attacks on our homeland, we will continue to be vulnerable. So that's what we have to keep focused on. To place this issue uh, in context, as uh, Max Thornberry said, this new proposal that we are considering today, uh, along with the legislation pending in the subcommittee, borrows productively uh, from many of the ideas that my colleagues uh, and this committee have been considering. The basic idea that we need to do a threat assessment Develop and coordinate a homeland security strategy is not new, but it is urgent. Uh, I support the thrust of the President's proposal, uh, as introduced on Thursday, and I endorse the notion of Leader Gephardt that we set 9-11-2002 as the target date for completing congressional action to fine-tune the concept and enact it into law. After all, Mr. Chairman, Dedicated American workers have already removed all of the debris from ground zero ahead of schedule. And they will complete repairs of the Pentagon ahead of schedule as well. In fact, I understand that today is the last day of work on the Pentagon, and what remains only is a ceremony to place one last block that survives from 9-11-2001 in place. That's tremendous. Look what we accomplished. Doesn't it make sense? that we set an ambitious goal here, too, uh, to complete this work, perhaps to pass the conference report in our extraordinary session set in New York City on September 6th, and then to sign this bill into law, to be present when our president signs this bill into law uh, at, on 9-11-2002 at the Pentagon. It seems to me it would be the most fitting tribute to those killed at the World Trade Center, at the Pentagon, and those who courageously died in Pennsylvania, if our government could act in a bipartisan fashion so quickly to protect the rest of the nation. A number of ideas uh, underlying the President's proposal are not new, as I mentioned. Uh, Pre-9-11, Speaker Hastert set up a working group on terrorism and homeland security on which um, uh, my colleague Jim Gibbons serves and on which I am the ranking member. We were charged with assessing the capability and performance of the intelligence agencies to prevent attacks. Many of our uh, ideas were included in last year's intelligence authorization bill. More will be in this year's, and we will release a preliminary report on our findings soon. Over the last half decade, uh, as uh, Mac Thornberry mentioned, there have been several major commissions. There was the Hart-Rudman Commission, and we will hear from Senator Rudman shortly, there was the Gilmore Commission, which is still uh, in service. Uh, Congress has extended it a third time to cover additional work. And there was the Commission on Terrorism, also called the Bremer Commission, on which I served. All of them did good work. All of them warned of imminent major attacks on the homeland and proposed legal and structural changes, alas, too few of which were actually implemented pre-9-11. But although we've all been working on this for a while, the form of this proposal, the new proposal by the President, is different from many of the previous proposals that have been made. H.R. 4660, which is pending before your committee and which is co-sponsored by all of us sitting up here and which, uh, of which the companion uh, version exists in the Senate, um, uh, offered by Senator Lieberman, uh, is different from H.R. 4660. In our proposal, HR is different from the President's proposal. In HR 4660, we would put uh, authority in a White House coordinator uh, position, which would have statutory and budgetary authority uh, over a homeland security strategy, and then we would set up a separate department. The administration would put most of that authority in the separate department, 
But as far as I am concerned, I agree with Mac Thornberry that either way is acceptable and we can work with the administration proposal as our base. I see my time is up. I just want to touch on three other points. First of all, we must acknowledge that we don't have all the answers. Many of them reside in the private sector. 90% of our critical infrastructure is owned by the private sector. And they have significant experience, more than our government does, with reorganization and mergers. But there are many pluses in the administrative plan, administration plan, particularly it's bold and innovative. There are also many minuses, which I'm sure will come out as we talk about this further. They can be dealt with. We can do this. We must do this. It is critical to protect against the next wave of attacks. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gibbons, I, Representative Gibbons, I'm calling on you next, but I just want to again thank our senators for allowing the House members their opportunity to talk about the legislation uh, as according to protocol and appreciate your patience. Uh, Representative Gibbons. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. And again, thank you for having a hearing on what I believe is probably the most important, <clears throat> if not the most historic, reorganization of American government since 1947. Uh, it is indeed a privilege to be here, and I'd ask unanimous consent to my full and complete written testimony be entered into the record. I will attempt to summarize uh, my thoughts uh, briefly in the time allowed. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, this is the nine-month anniversary of September the 11th, the attack on the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, and unfortunately the Barron Fields in Pennsylvania. This country has come together as a united country more so today than at any time I can remember and rightfully so. Uh, too often times we forget and uh, lose sight of the freedoms that we have in this country as a result of the efforts of many of our men and women who serve in our armed forces, and we must never forget that. And Mr. Chairman, also let me say that September the 11th did not necessarily change the minds of what we were saying prior to September the 11th, but September the 11th changed who was listening. And now we have an opportunity to move forward, I think, and protect uh, and provide for the American people an opportunity to give them greater security than we've had uh, since at any time that we have addressed the issue of terrorism. I was privileged and honored to be with my colleagues that are sitting here uh, at this table in a meeting with the President, the Vice President, and Governor Tom Ridge last Friday uh, when we discussed this. And out of that meeting came, I think, a uniform agreement that we have to move forward on this issue and we have to move forward quickly. And most importantly, Mr. President, the American public needs this kind of legislation. We cannot afford to let another well-intended idea get dragged down by the uh, weight of bureaucracy. And I believe the citizens of America deserve better than that. And as the Vice Chairman of the Terrorism and Homeland Security Subcommittee that my colleague Jane Harmon and I both uh, sit on, there has been a reoccurring theme that has uh, been brought to us uh, time and time again, and that is the failure or the lack of ability to share information. The so-called Phoenix Memo that we've read about and heard so much about is a perfect example. Those in charge of connecting the dots do not always get the dots connected to form a complete picture. Mr. Chairman, let me express this as an idea. It is as if we had a large puzzle, all broken up and put in a big box. And each agency reaches in and grabs a handful of those parts of that puzzle and goes off to their separate offices, whether it's the CIA, the FBI, the Border Patrol, the INS, Customs, you name it. They're in different rooms in different offices trying to put together a part of a puzzle, but they don't have the big picture. We need to break down those walls and allow for them to see what each other's information and intelligence is providing, to give us a uniform picture, the information that we need to be able to stop future terrorist attacks. The stovepiped information or the failure to share information uh, between agencies has got to stop. And this legislation, I believe, will help arrange that. This Congress should have no higher priority to the American public than to pass this legislation. But there are a few questions that should be addressed and should be answered in the meantime. I would like to suggest that we need to find out how the new Secretary of Homeland Security will obtain key information from other agencies like the FBI, like the CIA, 
And, and will he be able to task those agencies for that information? And will he receive the same briefings that the President of the United States receives? And we must answer these questions, Mr. Chairman, and I believe that as we work this legis legislation through Congress, we can get those questions asked. And I believe also that the Director of Homeland Security must ensure both horizontal and vertical integration of that intelligence information. And I include vertical all the way down to the first responders, those individuals at our state and local government that have to respond to these incidences at the first uh, occurrence. Mr. Chairman, those are some of the ideas, and I believe uh, that we have other uh, opportunities. We've had a drug czar that uh, has failed because of bureaucracy to get uh, actually a strong foothold uh, on America's drug problem. I do not want this agency and this issue to meet the same result. Uh, let, me, let me cite one little quick uh, quote uh, from the Boston Globe. Uh, Mr. Ash Carter once noted that the White House czars have been historically toothless, unable to control activities of cabinet bureaucracies. To be effective as Homeland Security czar, Ridge will need influence over budget. As uh, my colleague Ms. Harmon and, uh, of course, Mac Thornberry have already said, H.R. 4660 gives the director real teeth and granting him authority to approve or reject budgets that pertain to Homeland Security. And I think this is critical and as part of the $38 billion budget that we are going to address and spend on Homeland Security, it is important to give uh, some oversight authority uh, to Congress to make sure that the money is spent well. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, my time is up. I do, again, want to thank you for the opportunity to be here to testify on this historic piece of legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Gibbons. Uh, Representative Tauscher. I'm always happy to use Senator Lieberman's microphone. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for inviting me to testify today, and uh, thank you to all my colleagues for your attention to this issue that you've, I know, been working on, as well as those colleagues at the table, uh, to make sure that we can work on behalf of the American people to create the opportunity to make these urgent steps uh, that our nation must take to better face the threat of terrorism, a reality in the not-too-distant future. I'd also like to recognize the strong leadership of my colleagues at the table, including Senator Lieberman, whose tireless efforts led to the Government Affairs Committee in the Senate to pass out a bill recently, and to, and to Congressman Thornberry for spearheading this effort in the House through a number of different versions. Mr. Chairman, the American people are waiting and watching, as well as our allies and adversaries are waiting and watching. I think the President did take a very bold step on Thursday, but I think it's important now, as he said on Thursday, that this is now something that only the United States Congress can do to create a new Department of Homeland Security. None of the turf fights or federal and congressional restructuring that the creation of the new agency will entail are going to be easy. We all recognize that. But we have a golden opportunity now that the President has articulated his agenda to defend the homeland. And Congress is ready to meet him with enabling legislation my colleagues and I have offered. We would be wise to explore all options, including establishing a special committee on Homeland Security before embracing or dismissing any possible reform. Congress cannot get bogged down in petty jurisdictional fights that would delay the process. While on a number of occasions Congress is forced to be a reactive body, Homeland Security reform is one area where Congress is ahead of the curve. Over the last several years, a number of congressional mandated panels have called to attention the growing ter terrorist threats to our homeland. We know about the Gilmore Commission. We know about the Hart-Rudman Commission. We will hear from Senator Rudman in a few minutes. In those recommendations on which the legislation that I and my colleagues, Mac Thornberry, Jane Harmon, and Jim Gibbons introduced several weeks ago, all of these different commissions, this legislation is based. I emphasize one point, Mr. Chairman. The bills in Congress and the President's call to action are not a knee-jerk reaction. 
They are based on long-standing recommendations by the intelligence and national security communities. The current system, as we know, is unworkable. We need to act, and I applaud Minority Leader Gephardt's suggestion that we work as possibly and as fast as possible and as closely together as we can, because this has always been a bipartisan, bicameral opportunity from the very beginning, that we work with the administration to get something done that we can present to the American people that can be signed on or before September 11, 2002. I have a little internecine local issue that I have to talk about briefly because it's important that Congress pay attention to the science issues uh, and that we pay close attention to the opportunity to galvanize the many different specialities that we have um, across the country uh, that the government controls, including the national labs. In the President's proposal, the entire Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, which is in my district, would become part of the new agency, even though only a small fraction of the work they do is relevant to Homeland Security. As everyone knows, Lawrence Livermore and Los Alamos Labs are the two national nuclear labs, and they are responsible for stockpile stewardship and our nuclear defense deterrent. In our bill, as it currently stands, there would be a liaison in the new agency who would only work with the lab, would, would be responsible for making sure that the labs work and their expertise, like the anthrax killing foam they invented a decade ago, would be well known to all of the different agencies. As this new agency takes form, I look forward to working with the administration and this committee to figure out the best way to use the expertise of all of our country's nuclear weapons labs and all of its science and technology opportunities to make sure that we can protect the American people. I thank the chair for holding this hearing today to get the ball rolling, and I look forward to any kind of questions the committee has, and I especially look forward to working with all of us to make sure that we can protect the American people from future attacks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Tauscher. The four of you uh, House members represent real heroes to this committee. You have been working on this issue pre-September 11th. Uh, you have been patient in waiting for this committee to conduct our hearing on your legislation, which we appreciate. Um, and uh, I just want you to know that we look forward to the dialogue that will take place uh, between the members on this committee and the panel and to say as well to any member that just came in, we're going to keep our opening statements. Uh, we're going to share opening statements uh, before um, Warren Rudman, uh, but after this panel has left. And now uh, to our colleagues from the Senate. Um, Senator Lieberman, um, you are obviously a friend and someone we admire deeply from Connecticut, obviously. So delighted you're here. And Arlen Specter, you have been on this issue as well for so many years. Uh, it's exciting to think that uh, Republicans and Democrats and House and Senate can work so closely on this issue, and it speaks well, I think, for the outcome. Senator Lieben, welcome. You have the floor. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thanks uh, for your leadership uh, on this issue. I, I agree with you. Uh, this is a group that you see before you, that, uh, bipartisan, bicameral, that has been working together now for several months on the question of homeland security. And uh, it's, it is both uh, a measure of the, uh, of the significance of the challenge we face and of our capacity to do here on uh, uh, homeland security what we have at our best done when it comes to international security, which is to leave uh, partisanship uh, at the borders. Uh, now that we've been struck within our borders, it's appropriate for us to leave partisanship aside generally and uh, achieve what's in the uh, interest of the security of the American people. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I have a statement which I'd ask to be included in the record and just want to speak uh, with you generally about where I think we are now. T to say the obvious, uh, American history changed on September 11th. The uh, security, unique security that we enjoyed over the most of the preceding centuries of our history because of geography. Uh, particularly the oceans, uh, was broken with a devastating impact uh, by the terrorists who acted that day and, and uh, showed us uh, with painful reality that no matter how strong we are, and we are, of course, the strongest nation in the history of the world, if people have no regard for their own lives, let alone the lives of, of others, uh, they can still do us damage. So. Um, we are, we are challenged now to uh, reach for our strength and to utilize it uh, to defend 
uh, against uh, attacks of this kind uh, in the future. And I, for one, do not accept as inevitable that there will be another September 11th uh, type attack. Uh, I think we have it within our capacity if we organize ourselves uh, to, um, to prevent uh, such attacks from occurring again. That certainly uh, should be our goal. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, as has been stated by my colleagues here on the panel, uh, there were many who were warning us about uh, exactly the kind of uh, attack that occurred on September 11th, long before September 11th. Uh, Senators uh, Warren Rudman and Gary Hart in some ways uh, sadly uh, may be uh, considered the, the Paul Revere's of our age because they were saying to us very loudly, uh, the terrorists are coming. Unfortunately, um, we, did, we didn't listen to them in time. At last uh, September, toward the end of the month after the attacks of September 11th, the Senate Governmental Affairs Committee held a hearing and, and uh, Warren and Rudman and Gary Hart were there. They testified along with others. Um, Senator Specter and I put together a bill that basically incorporates uh, their proposal uh, over time. We joined with our colleagues here in the House, uh, and um, later uh, we joined Senator Specter and I with Senator Graham, who had a different proposal, uh, put it together. And in fact, that, that was reported out of the Senate Governmental Affairs Committee uh, just about uh, three weeks ago. But, but the significant uh, development was the one that occurred last week when President Bush in, uh, embraced the ideas in our bill, most of them certainly those regarding the Department of Homeland Security, and added uh, additional ideas of his own, which I think overall uh, strengthen uh, the proposal. So uh, the challenge is now ours to act on this, as my colleagues have said, in a timely way. I want to make just a few points uh, about where we are and about the, uh, the, the uh, President's proposal particularly. Uh, it, it seems to me, as others have said, uh, Congressman Gibbons and others, that um, as we learn more about what happened prior to September 11th that created the vulnerability that the terrorists took advantage of, um, the, clearly um, the lack of coordination of intelligence, both domestic and foreign, uh, is, is part of what created that vulnerability. We can't let that happen again. Uh, in, the, in the President's proposal, there seems to be a, a kind of clearinghouse within the Department of Homeland Security for intelligence from different sources. I think all of us have to ask whether that's enough, um, whether uh, we need to put more authority either in the Secretary of Homeland Security or in another office in the White House, such as the Senate bill has, to if you will, demand the kind of coordination of intelligence uh, resources that is the, the, the best security that we will have. The experts on counterterrorism will always tell you that the best defense, if you will, here is an offense, and that, that is the best intelligence, so that we can know uh, what the terrorists are planning so that we can stop them before they strike, as we successfully did with uh, Mr. Muja here when we arrested him at uh, um, O'Hare Airport uh, about a month ago. I, I, I want to say that um, I, I hope that at some point, although probably not in our consideration and establishment of this department this year, because I think it's too big a step to take, that we consider um, whether either the entire FBI or the parts of it involved now in domestic intelligence quite appropriately ought to become part of the Department of Homeland Security. I raised the question uh, and suggest it may be more than we can bite off and absorb this year. Secondly, I want to stress very briefly the importance of the new Department of Homeland Security coordinating and making as one force the hundreds of thousands of local police officers, firefighters, emergency public health officials. Um, they are our eyes and ears out there. They can be critically important, not just in the emergency response function, but in the preventive intelligence function, and we've got to make adequate use of them. Uh, third, um, if I may sort of hold up a warning flag very briefly, there is language in the President's document put out last week that suggests a kind of broad civil service reform in the Director of, in the Secretary of Homeland Security. 
This has aroused fears that I have already heard, perhaps some of you have already heard from uh, federal employee organizations about uh, the possibility that this department and this legislation that we are considering may be used to diminish the collective bargaining rights of federal employees. That's a battle we cannot get into as we adopt this department. Members of Congress have different points of view on it, but it, it, it's, a, it's an issue to be joined at some point. I just say to my colleagues, let us not get um, trapped into that particular um, web because it, it'll tie us up so much that, that we may lose sight of the, of the main goal here. Finally, to say what I think we all feel, um, this piece of legislation may be the most important work that any of us ever do in our service in Congress. Uh, it is that important. And uh, I pledge to you, Mr. Chairman, and my colleagues in the, in the House, uh, the fullest cooperation as we work together to get this right uh, and to do it as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator Lieberman. Uh, a great deal, thank you. Senator Spector, you're the cleanup hitter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I commend you and this distinguished committee for moving ahead so promptly on this important subject. Yeah, just be clear. You have such a nice voice. We hear it almost as if the mic doesn't work. Could you just tap the mic and see if it works? I now see a green light, so I'll proceed. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for uh, your leadership in proceeding so promptly on this very important subject, and I appreciate the opportunity to appear here today. The issue of Homeland Security is developing more complex ramifications each day. And as this committee considers the restructuring of government, we now see that it's going to be necessary to re-examine some of our substantive laws. Uh, with the disclosure yesterday of the arrest of Abdullah al-Muhajir as an enemy combatant, uh, and noting the detention of civilians John Walker Lind and Yasser Isam Abdi, uh, the Congress under the Constitution has the authority to establish military tribunals and to establish the structure as to how these issues are to be handled. And while it is true that the Supreme Court of the United States decided during World War II that a petitioner hopped a U.S. citizen was classified as an enemy belligerent, and now we have Abdullah al-Muhajir classified as an enemy combatant, uh, I suggest to this committee that we're going to have to take a look at the substantive rules to see what our public policy ought to be on these prosecutions. That is a broader subject. And I note that the Attorney General uh, did not notify at least the Senate Judiciary Committee, neither the chairman nor the ranking member, as to this detention. And I do believe that it would be useful to get the institutional wisdom of committees on both sides, on our bicameral structure, to have some assistance. But I suggest that we need to take that question up. I do not challenge what Attorney General Ashcroft has done in detaining this man, who is a real menace, uh, but I do believe these are basic public policy considerations which ought to be considered by the Congress. Uh, with respect to the restructuring of government, uh, Senator Lieberman and Senator Graham and I have offered legislation on this subject, uh, but as the picture is unfolding, it is a great deal more complicated than picking up the Border Patrol and Coast Guard and FEMA and a variety of agencies, we're now looking at some really very, very difficult problems with the CIA and the FBI. And where we have seen last week the disclosures of Agent Colleen Rowley about the Zacharias Masui case, where the FBI used the wrong standard on going for a warrant under the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, and the U.S. Attorney in Minnesota thought they needed a 75 to 80 percent probability, and Colleen Rowley talked about preponderance of evidence more likely than not 51 percent. That's simply not the law. So that there's going to have to be uh, in a, a new agency an, uh, an authority to dig down 
and see what's going on and on the Phoenix memo without dwelling unduly uh, there. Uh, there. There's a very tough matter here about what we all know been categorized as the culture of concealment. And two very brief references to what I've seen. The Governmental Affairs Committee in investigating campaign finance reform in 1997 asked the FBI for some material. They said they didn't have it. And then we found it in the CIA records that the FBI had turned over to the CIA, and either the FBI didn't know they had it or they were not forthcoming. Uh, I commented on that at some length in the congressional record back on September 16, 1997. And one brief uh, comment about the CIA. Uh, when I chaired the Intelligence Committee during the 104th Congress, I saw many, many instances, but one I will describe within a minute, and that is a 40-year veteran in the CIA had turned over tainted materials which came from the Soviet Union. That is, they were doctored, and he knew that. And he made those available on uh, so January 13th to both President Bush and President-elect Clinton. And when asked why he did that, it's an incredible story, he said he didn't tell them that it was tainted because if he did, they wouldn't use it. And the next question was, how do you know it was reliable? And he said, I know it's reliable because of my experience. And incredibly, he would uh, turn it over to the highest levels of government. And I haven't given you uh, the whole story, but it is an illustration as to an attitude uh, which simply has to be uh, dealt with. And how, how we're going to deal with it is a matter of enormous difficulty. Uh, one of the ideas which uh, uh, Senator Lieberman, Senator Graham, and I have been working on is to have somewhere uh, what might be called a National Terrorism Assessment Center, which would have uh, information compiled by all the intelligence agencies, FBI, CIA, NSA, DIA, State, INS, Justice, Customs, the whole works, so that at one point there is a repository for all of the information to be analyzed. Because had all of the information been available as to what uh, Murad, the Pakistani terrorist connected with Al-Qaeda, Al -Qaeda talked about going into the CIA headquarters and the White House, and had we followed Masui and gotten into his computer, and had the Phoenix Memorandum all be, been put together, uh, uh, my judgment is that there was a veritable blueprint uh, in advance of 9-11, and Senator Graham has testified further using the connecting the dots analogy that those items and others are only part of the picture, that from his position he knows a great deal more. So we have a very heavy responsibility, and I'm delighted to see this committee working on it so promptly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Senator Spector. We're going to... Uh just go right directly to questions, not statements, but I would like to um, just acknowledge the members that are present, uh, Mr. Gilman, Mr. Souter, Mr. Lewis, Dr. Weldon, Mr. Putnam, Mr. Otter, on the Republican side and on the Democratic side. Um, we have Mr. Kucinich, the ranking member of this committee. Uh, we have Ms. Sikowski, uh, Ms. Norton, uh, and Mr. Tierney and, and Ms. Watson. We usually do 10 minutes uh, per question. We're going to do five minutes given the number of members. I'm going to uh, suggest, though, that if, if a number of members are going to respond, if you ask one but others want to jump in, we might have a little leeway in the five-minute rule, and that'll be my judgment. I'll try to be fair about it. So we'll start with you, Dr. Weldon. Uh, I thank my colleague, and I certainly want to join with the others for commending uh, him on the leadership he's provided on this important issue. Um, and before I get to my question, I want to commend Senator Lieberman for what he said uh, about it's not necessarily going to happen that we're going to be attacked again. Um, as I travel around the country, I hear a lot of people saying that sort of thing. And I believe there's power in our words. I think if we as a nation really uh, join together and do the right things and all the agencies come together, we can prevent another attack from happening in the United States. The question I have um, is, uh, 
we're going to reorganize reorganize the executive branch <laughs> should we also be talking talking about reorganizing ourselves uh, you know we have the armed services committee oversees the army navy air force marines and we have in the senate the finance committee in the house the ways and means committee for tax policy um, but yet i have this chart here that shows a busy chart all the different uh, committees in the House and Senate with jurisdiction. Now, I know uh, nobody wants to create another committee in the, in the House and the Senate with all the uh, criticism of bureaucracy that we get, but if you're not going to create another permanent committee, people keep saying that this is going to be very difficult to get through the House and the Senate, and should the Speaker and the Minority Leader and the majority leader in the Senate and, and, and the minority leader come together and maybe form at least a temporary select committee uh, and perhaps maybe draw on people from all the committees of jurisdiction so that we can, uh, and the staff from the respective committees, so that we can indeed get this done uh, expeditiously and maybe have it finished in September like Mr. Gephardt has proposed. Um, so I'll just open that up. Any of you want to respond to that? Mr. Weldon, let me uh, begin by saying one of the favorite games in Washington, a favorite parlor game in Washington, is turf war. And it's not just limited to the administration. It's also within the uh, United States Congress, both the Senate and the House. Uh, I couldn't agree more with you that at a time that is as pressing as this is for our nation, that we need to look at everything possible to ensure not only do we have uh, expediency, but we have an efficiency in dealing with these types of issues. Uh, we've got a very large project ahead of us. We have a very limited amount of time within which to do it. If we assigned uh, responsibility to, I believe, 66 different committees, or how many ever there are in both the Senate and the House, uh, we would find ourselves here till uh, time eternity. Uh, trying to deal with all of these issues. I think there has to be uh, some direction, and we are working with the leadership today uh, to provide uh, for, just as you have suggested, perhaps uh, a single committee with jurisdiction uh, as directed by the leadership to take this issue and to represent this issue through the United States Congress. So you, you spoke with the House leadership? No, I say we are working uh, to that regard. We are. Uh, intending to meet with the House leadership are, are you on this very issue. a permanent committee or a temporary select committee to move this legislation through? This is, this is the point we will be talking about. We want to discuss whether it will be a permanent or a temporary committee, but in either event, we have to have one committee assigned to do this heavy lifting uh, on this bill uh, because there are so many committees with jurisdiction over this issue. I'd like to hear from the Senate side. Thanks, thanks, Dr. Weldon. Um, obviously, there's a distinction here between uh, how we handle the legislation before us on the right. question of creating right. a new Department of Homeland Security, and then after it's mm -hmm. created, who has jurisdiction over the department. Uh, I can only speak for the Senate yeah. side. Uh, under uh, the Senate rules, uh, Rule 25, it, it's certainly clear to me that the Senate Governmental Affairs committee has jurisdiction for any proposals regarding the organization or reorganization of the executive branch. Now, having said that, and, uh, obviously the decision is ultimately going to be up to the leaders, but the, uh, the, the proposal uh, that Senator Specter and Graham and I introduced uh, was referred uh, by the clerk to Senate Governmental Affairs and reported out uh, from there. Um, as to um, uh, which committees or committee handles the department once it's created. That's a separate commission again for all of us, a, a separate question again for all of us. I, I, I'd give you a first reaction, which is it, it, this will be the second largest department in the federal government. It will become, homeland defense will become second only to, to defense, international defense, as, as we consider how we carry out our constitutional responsibility to provide for the common defense. So uh, I, I, don't, I don't see how we, we handle it without creating a new committee in each chamber, mm -hmm. which would be the Committee on Homeland Security. Yeah. I would just like to add um, two things. First of all, I, I see it as Senator Lieberman does, that there are two phases. One is to consider the legislation, and the second is 
then to oversee and authorize what comes next. I think uh, uh, this committee in the House is very capable of considering this legislation, and if we invent a new committee structure, I'm afraid we delay, and that's my second point. I read in the newspaper today that the administration may not be able to send up legislation until after July 4. I think that's regrettable. I think that probably has to do with turf wars downtown, and they are regrettable. And so I would hope that either uh, on our own initiative or with their expedited assistance, we could have legislation introduced here in the next few days, referred to the relevant committees on both sides, and we could roll and consider it and get it done by 9-11. Thank you, um, Representative Kucinich. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this hearing, and thanks to my colleagues for the work that they're doing to try to protect our nation. I, I wanted to uh, ask uh, Senator Lieberman uh, a, a question that is actually something that this committee has grappled with for some time, and, and that is, uh, do you think, Senator, that it would be useful for our country to have a comprehensive threat and risk assessment of the nation's vulnerabilities prior to this kind of massive restructuring which we are about to embark on? Uh, I, I think we're now at a point, thanks for that question, Congressman Kucinich, uh, I think we're at a point, uh, particularly after September 11th, where, where the vulnerabilities are, are uh, clear and We've had a series of, uh, if you will, threat assessments, both internal and classified, but also the external public work uh, done um, um, by the Hart-Rudman Commission, the Gilmore Commission, the Bremer Commission, uh, and in fact, uh, uh, in, a, in an ongoing uh, series of uh, uh, appearances by witnesses, um, director of the CIA, uh, director of FBI, that have spoken to this. So. I think we, we, we know the problem is there, and uh, uh, it, it's not bad to uh, have a, a, another assessment done as a new secretary comes in, the but I think we've got to really uh, organize our, our troops, if I can put it that way, and I mean it that way, our troops for homeland defense, and we've got to do that uh, quickly. Well, here, here's, my, here's my concern, uh, Senator, and any member of the panel. Um, we're looking at a, a massive allocation of resources and reallocation of resources here. Uh, the uh, president has an executive order where, um, when he created Governor Ridge's position, he directed the governor to develop a national strategy. And we, we, I'm not aware that this committee's received that, that strategy, and what I'm wondering is, um, if we're going through this reorganization, we haven't seen a comprehensive threat and risk assessment. We haven't seen a national strategy developed. Uh, wouldn't it be better to have the risk assessment as part of a strategy and then proceed with reorganization? Does anyone want to answer that? Uh, my, my answer, respectfully, is no. Um, th that uh, the, the problem is so evident to us. We've, we've lost more than 3,000 of our fellow citizens on September 11th uh, and the anthrax attacks that followed that we've, we've got to get organized. And as we get organized, we can also have a strategy. You know, it, it strikes me, as I was listening to you, I, don't, I believe that, the, that uh, Governor Ridge was going to come out with his... Uh, threat assessment and overall strategy in July. And I think prior to the surprising but welcome announcement by the President last week, a lot of us assumed that we would hear then about what thoughts the administration had regarding reorganization. So obviously I'm not the one to answer, but I wouldn't be surprised if we hear that uh, th overall threat assessment and strategy uh, early in July, which I understood was the schedule that Governor Ridge was on. Well, I, I just want to make it, I, I, I do want to go to, to Mr. Okay, go ahead. Mr. Mack, you wanted to respond? Well, please, Mr. Kucinich, I'd, I'd say, as Senator Lieberman said, the, 
the White House is going to have a strategy that they come to us. But whatever that strategy is, we've got to have the folks who are guarding our borders be able to work together. We need to have to make we need to make sure the Customs Service radios talk work with the Coast Guard radios, and that the 11 different databases that these organizations have become compatible. So there are some basics at work here that regard regardless of what your strategy is or how it evolves, and I'd suggest it will evolve as we get new information, there's some things that we need to do. And, and bringing together uh, the organizations to guard the border, that deal with cyber terrorism, that deal with emergency response, bringing them together so they are coordinated, focused together, is a basic that we need regardless of the strategy. Uh, I, your point's well taken. Uh, Mr. Thornberry, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of the, we just had a hearing, Mr. Chairman, about how the Department of Defense has, at latest count, 1,167 different accounting systems that they haven't been able to get together. Uh, so I can understand how if you have a few Coast Guard and other radio systems that aren't uh, together, that's a problem. Uh, I, I, I want to say, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your indulgence here, that a comprehensive threat assessment has not been done. Uh, and the reason why we may want to consider that it should be done before we proceed with this massive reorganization is that we should determine which threats are more immediate and which are less. Otherwise, how do we know what we should devote more resources towards? Uh, the um, executive order which created uh, Governor Ridge's position uh, talked about developing a national strategy. And all of us are here concerned that our country be protected. And I salute the members of this Congress who are dedicated and putting all your time into creating this. Uh, but I would respectfully submit that uh, so we don't get, uh, indulge in an Alice in Wonderland journey here, that first it might be good to have a uh, national strategy and a threat assessment and a risk assessment before we embark on this uh, great reorganization. I thank the chair, and I thank Congressman, you. Congressman, if I could just add very briefly one thing. I think that we have to understand that there's a, a separation here that we have to all agree to. The first is we have to prevent and we have to prepare. And part of the problem is, is that the intelligence functions are part of the prevention issues. Um, I actually want to split a hair here. My colleagues, both Senator Lieberman and Dr. Weldon, have said that you know, we're all concerned whether these attacks are inevitable or not. The attacks are inevitable. The question is, can we prevent the attacks from being the cataclysmic events we saw on September 11th? And so we have to do the right thing. What we're talking about here is the, is the preparing part. Uh, we need the intelligence agencies. We need harmonization of computers. We need all of the work done to uh, analyze and archive and alert and advise. That's the intelligence function. But unless we have all of these functionaries, the, the men and women, the good Americans that are working on the Border Patrol and Customs in the right place uh, and do it ex in a very expeditious way, we're never going to be able to deal with this sense of preparing and preventing. I, I thank the gentlelady. And I, I think we are in agreement of the need to protect this country. The idea of a um, comprehensive risk and threat assessment uh, will address, I believe, the issue of inevitability, because there are some of us who feel that perhaps if we have that kind of assessment, we'd be able to make the determination as to whether or not these uh, uh, alleged uh, or uh, pr uh, predicted attacks are, in fact, inevitable. I thank the gentlelady again. Let me just say before recognizing Mr. Putnam, and then we will go to Ms. Sikowski. I'm sorry, we'll go to uh, Representative Norton next. Um, that we will probably proceed in the spirit of, of, of your comments and also Senator Lieberman's and, and the other members who have spoken, uh, really on a dual track. I mean, before, before you see the reorganization of government, I think you will see the threat assessment outlined and the strategy articulated. Um, because your point is well taken. You're not going to see the reorganization of government without that. But I don't think we need to wait until that happens before we begin this part of the process. I, I, think, the, I think the American people will take comfort in the chair's recognition that uh, it should at least proceed on a dual track basis. And I think that's the comments that Thank I've you. seen from the others. Well, uh, we'll go with Mr. Putnam. Mr. Putnam? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to echo the comments that have been made about this group of uh, 
congressmen and women who were on the cutting edge of, of bringing this issue to the fore. And one of the first subcommittee hearings that, that I participated in uh, as, a, as a member of the 107th Congress, we were presented with the, the Hart-Rudman report, which at that time said America will become increasingly vulnerable to hostile attack on our homeland and our military superiority will not entirely protect us. It said Americans will likely die on American soil, possibly in large numbers. It said Americans are less secure than they believe that they are. And with all due respect to my colleague on the panel, this is no longer an academic discussion. To characterize this as an Alice in Wonderland pursuit is irresponsible. And I would like to, uh, to the degree possible, ask you some questions specifically about the legislation, recognizing that the president's plan has not come forward yet, and, and so we're sort of dealing with what y'all have put forward and what we think the, the administration will put forward in detail. What role will the National Guard play in this new Department of Homeland Security, or will it remain separate and a part of the Department of Defense? Uh, the short answer, Mr. Putnam, is it will remain separate. Uh, uh, a number of us are on Armed Services Committee in the House and the Senate. I, there are some reforms that need to be made there, in my view, but not as a part of this legislation. If I may, uh, if I may add a word uh, uh, to that, the answer uh, is, of course, correct that Congressman Thornberry gave that it will remain separate under the legislation. But, but your question raises an important point. Um, Right now, the Pentagon uh, is considering, and I believe that either the Secretary may have it or maybe on the way to the President, a, uh, uh, the creation of a Northern Command, uh, which is to expand the duties of the, of the Commander-in-Chief now at uh, Colorado Springs, Colorado, to include Homeland Defense and the employment of the assets of the Pentagon uh, for that purpose, including presumably, uh, I'm sure, the, the National Guard. Um, so. That's happening, and I think it does. I ask my colleagues on this committee to, to think about that, and we will on the Senate side as we consider um, the proposal as part of our shared uh, bill, which which in, which creates an office of uh, counterterrorism in the White House, an advisor to the president, who has coordinating uh, capacity, not over, not only over the Department of Homeland Security, but but intelligence, FBI, and the assets of the Pentagon that are involved in uh, homeland defense, because not everything will be done by the Department of Homeland Security. Th thank you, Senator. I, I understand that. I, I think that it's important, though, that this panel, and, and as we move through the details of this, recognize the huge role the National Guard will have to play. M Mr. Putnam, I just wanted on, to add I, that just, because... Hang on, let, me, let me just get okay. to this. Let me just say something. You'll get more time if another panelist wants to respond. Okay. So you don't... I, I realize the five-minute rule is kind of stinks, but and we'll I just, go beyond that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just wanted to add that. The National Guard presently plays a huge role uh, in our Homeland Security program everywhere in the country, and they are to be commended. There would be no possible way to put every function of government into one little package or one big package. Uh, but I think uh, what the President has done here is to put, is to apply a functional analysis to what should be there and to move those boxes in there. I agree with Senator Lieberman that there must remain a coordinating function in the White House and uh, that was the legislation that Jim Gibbons and I introduced over here uh, some time back that then became part of this bigger bill that the committee is considering. Um, how much authority that function should have, I think, will depend on what the Department of Homeland Security ends up looking like. Um, but I think that combination will assure that the National Guard resources, which remain in the Pentagon, are most effectively utilized uh, under the National uh, Command, the Northern Command structure. Uh, Mr. Putnam, let me add just one little brief comment here uh, in addition to what has already been said. It must be remembered uh, that the National Guard is a state agency until it's federalized, uh, which puts uh, a very difficult uh, premise in there when you start reshuffling the National Guard into other federal agencies. It is called up under, uh, I forgot the title number now, which goes then into the Department of Defense when it is federalized. Otherwise, you've got 50 state agencies called the National Guard, which are under the governor of each respective state. So we have to keep in mind the, that uh, difficult, complexing factor in this as well. Well, I, I appreciate that, and if you, 
if you look at the functional chart that the administration has put out it tends to focus on the key areas of, of the information gathering the border security the weapons of mass destruction is what i would characterize the seaburn function as being and what what doesn't appear in, in my opinion is how we deal with the non foreign threats if it's homeland security which of those functions deals with homegrown terror which of those functions deals with uh, oklahoma city type incidents which deals with uh, the mailbox bomber type incidents and, and homegrown type issues uh, that are not that do not reach the, the the critical mass of a weapon of mass destruction, but are nevertheless a threat to homeland security. Yeah, Mr. Putnam, let me just uh, briefly say that I believe that we're dealing with two different categories. We're dealing with international terrorism, and that's the issue that we're trying to uh, coordinate today between the CIA's information, because it, it's by law and by statute prevented from uh, spying on any American citizen, whether they're in a foreign country or here in the United States. It is that information uh, that we're trying to coordinate between agencies. I believe the FBI is best prepared to deal with uh, crimes committed within the United States by individuals, whether you call them uh, terrorist uh, acts, uh, such as we saw as the Nomura Federal Building in Oklahoma City, the pipe bomber which was arrested in the state of Nevada recently. So you don't believe that that, so that is a separate issue and will remain within the purview of the FBI? I think it is a separate issue that will remain in the purview of the FBI. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before representing, Rep uh, before uh, giving the floor to Representative Norton, I just want to acknowledge the presence of Representative Davis, who is the ranking member on the uh, Subcommittee on Civil Service and uh, Agency Organization, uh, a teammate with Dr. Weldon, and also to welcome uh, our colleague, uh, Mr. Platts, as well. So, Ms. Norton, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and just let me thank you for the what is so typical of your leadership in getting this bipartisan panel together so early uh, and, and tell you how much I appreciate it. I serve on two committees which have been considering uh, homeland security. Um, I'm not on the subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to come uh, and, 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 and sit today. I am on another committee that went very far. This is by far the more comprehensive legislation. In, in the other bill uh, took into account that uh, uh, ground zero uh, when it comes to homeland security in New York may have been Twin Towers. It is my district. Uh, if we think about our country, um, there's some speculation, for example, that the dirty bomb, that is only speculation, uh, may have been headed for the district. I, I saw the man land in, 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 San Francisco, uh, in, in Chicago. Uh, but the district does uh, serve on the Justice Department Terrorism uh, Task Force, uh, and it is the first responder. Uh, the other bill takes that into account. So the federal presence is here, all of us is here, all of us are here, and that if, if anything goes wrong in this district, it is in this city and in this region that, 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 that we must call upon, and I'd like to see this bill take account of that uh, as, as well. I have questions uh, regarding the, um, the Lieberman uh, Thornberry bill. Perhaps Mr. Thornberry could take one, Mr. Lieberman the other, particularly since it raises an issue uh, that he himself uh, raised. Um, Ms. Tauscher's uh, uh, alluded to something that's going to come up time and time and time again, and that is people are going to say, how come you're taking the whole thing out of uh, and putting it there, and what is going to happen to the real homeland part of this, the part that has to do with my district, the part that has to do with domestic concerns. Unless you have an answer for that, that is explicit either statutorily or administratively, uh, at some point along the way you may have a backlash from people saying they're not being attended to because the whole thing went over and the whole world now is about terrorism and no one cares about what is happening with respect to that particular issue here. I mean, the, the, the major one may be immigra immigration services and uh, the INS, although one could argue that immigration services are, in fact, related uh, to the law enforcement services. But, I mean, that, that, that's the major one there. For Mr. Lieberman, um, whom I regard as a like mind on a number of issues, in, including a bill that he and I uh, are working on together in another capacity, uh, I, I, have to, I have to ask Senator Lieberman to say more 
about the tantalizing and important issue he raised about the FBI. But he did it in the careful Lieberman way because he doesn't want to uh, uh, complicate an already complicated issue. The reason I ask you to say more is that the major criticism of the president's plan and therefore for ultimately of, of the Lieberman-Thornberry bill will be that the major problem was not these agencies that you're dealing with. The major problem was the CIA and the FBI, and you still leave us wondering about those agencies, so that if we had some greater sense that we would move at some point, and what you're thinking was, I think, there would be greater comfort and less criticism of the present bill for not, in fact, touching upon that issue. So in either order that you... Before answering, I, 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 there's probably a number of you would want to answer that, and we'll give you more time if they do, because this is a key element of the question. So all of you feel free to jump in. So. Uh, thanks uh, uh, very much, uh, Ms. Norton, uh, for your question. My own feeling is that the fact of September 11th that the attack occurred is evidence that there was a breakdown that the status quo failed to protect the American people. Um, some of that was uh, intelligence and law enforcement, but some of it was not. Some of it had to do with uh, uh, border uh, control agencies. Some of it had to do with the FAA, I think. Uh, uh, some of it had to do with, uh, one, one could argue, with our foreign policy over the years. Um, so I do think that in, that in bringing these agencies together, as, as uh, my colleagues here have indicated earlier, we're, we're going uh, to tighten our defenses generally in ways that uh, the events of September 11th uh, showed need to be tightened. But you're right, as, as, as evidence gathers both from congressional investigations and from uh, media inquiries, it, the, the most um, troubling, infuriating, and I, I have to say uh, heartbreaking uh, because of the deaths that occurred on September 11th uh, evidence is of the, the flow of information that, as uh, my colleague Senator Specter says, wasn't just dots that weren't connected. It, it was a blueprint that wasn't seen. And that had to do with intelligence and, and law enforcement, FBI and CIA. So our answer to that and our proposal was to have this White House office uh, coordinating with, with statutory responsibility to coordinate uh, FBI, CIA, law enforcement, intelligence. In the President's proposal, uh, there is a clearinghouse, a threat assessment section within the Department of Homeland Security. Again, the President hasn't uh, presented the proposal in legislative language, so we don't know exactly what it will entail. It, I, I'm a bit concerned now that it, that group seems like a kind of passive customer uh, of whatever the CIA, FBI send them, and not uh, in control. Not in, uh, uh, not, uh, in other words, it's more supply side than demand side, if I can misuse a metaphor. But Senator, you suggested this morning you go even beyond where your bill takes us thus far. Well, uh, yeah. I, I wanted to put it on the table, but uh, it may, it's probably more than we can uh, uh, embrace in, uh, as we create this department, and, and probably we need to uh, get some experience with it. But as the FBI becomes, and in my opinion, appropriately more involved in what might be called domestic intelligence work, how do we get the information that will help us to prevent uh, terrorism from occurring, uh, whether that more appropriately belongs within the Department of Homeland Security. That, that's a big question, uh, and, and one that uh, probably we're not able to answer in the short run. In the short run, we ought to end this process feeling that we've got not just a, an ongoing working relationship now between the CIA and FBI, but we've got something in law that compels that coordination uh, to, the, to the best extent we can. Ms. Norton, uh, let me just mention on that and your, the first part of your question. If we pass our legislation or the President's legislation today exactly like I would like it, we still cannot all pack up our bags and go home. There is lots of work to do with intelligence, with the National Guard, with you know a whole list of, of agencies. And so I, I just want to be careful that 
we all recognize this is not a magic answer to all our problems. It's good and it's important, but we still have work to do. Now, exactly what part of what agencies get brought in you raise, uh, and, and some of this is, is, is going to be a judgment call. I think some of them are easy. All of FEMA needs to be brought into the Department of Homeland Security. Whether you are training or responding to a hurricane or uh, some sort of terrorist incident, you know, it, it, it's, it's the same sorts of skills, the same sorts of relationships with state and local governments. That's very important to bring that together. You raise immigration, I think it's a more difficult call about exactly where's the best place for the service part of INS to go. You know, we've already voted to split it in two, uh, but exactly where that part goes, it's, it's not absolutely clear to me, and we just have to work through those. But, but, but I regard those as important but they are details, exactly how the reporting chains will go and, and exactly what part of what agencies. The key is just use a common sense approach, do the best you can. We may have to come back and adjust just as Congress had to come back and adjust the National Security Act of 1947 several times. Uh, we, not, none of us are gonna get it perfect even if we spend 10 years working on it. We do the best we can, put things together that make sense, uh, and try to use just the common sense test. Um, Ms. Norton, as a, one of the lawyers on this panel, speaking to someone who is a, uh, a, a, an excellent lawyer herself, I would just like to raise a note of caution about moving the FBI into this department. And my primary reason is that it is and remains a law enforcement agency. It also has, under the reorganization by the new director, which I think is a sensible reorganization, a large intelligence function, but the law enforcement piece has to remain separate. If people are to be afforded due process under the Constitution, there has to be a firewall uh, to protect grand jury information and other things uh, affecting their own cases. And we're going to have a long debate in this country for sure, and we're having it now, about how to rebalance our increased security needs with our Constitution and civil liberties. But certainly, I think, uh, one way to keep that balance is to keep a separate and, and better functioning FBI. Ms. Norton. And of course, they have a terrorism, they have a terrorism function that is quite, right. quite apart from right. the investigator. Ms. Norton, you referred to uh, the Livermore Lab issue. Um, in our bill, we had essentially created um, a science and technology clearinghouse, uh, the opportunity to detail uh, people from our national labs, both in the nuclear design labs and our science labs, so that we could have um, a portfolio of very needed science and technology uh, catalogs to be able to be readily available to anyone that was involved in Homeland Security. The L Lawrence Livermore Lab in my district's primary responsibility is stockpile stewardship, nuclear weapons design, and to make sure that our nuclear deterrence is safe and reliable. Um, they have, obviously, a um, couple hundred, 300, 400 people that work on weapons of mass destruction, detection devices, and they have a lot of experience with international terrorism on these issues. Um, those were the people that could be migrated. The Livermore Labs employees are not federal employees. They work for the University of California because of the contracting relationship. Um, we don't believe that the White House really intended to move the lab over into Homeland Security. Um, and we're working with them to make sure that the lab, which is part of the National Nuclear Security Administration, uh, that Chairman Thornberry chairs and I am the ranking Matt Pe member of the panel on, on the Armed Services Committee oversee. So we think that this was a drafting mistake that is going to get fixed. But obviously, we can't get bogged down in these issues because we need to galvanize the support of Congress to move forward. Thank you. Uh, at this time, the chair would recognize uh, Mr. L Mr. Lewis. And then we'll go, I think, uh, to you, Mr. Tierney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> You know, um, for years, uh, Congress uh, has been told that we were going to face not if, but when we were going to have a, a terrorist attack on this nation. Um, and we, I've been here going on nine years now, and I've heard it every year. Um, the CIA told us. Uh, the commissions told us. Um, and it happened. It didn't happen just on 9-11. It happened several years before that at the World Trade Center. Um, 
and you know my question you know why didn't we learn from that experience um, why were there not questions to the CIA and to the FBI and to other agencies of why that happened uh, maybe 9-11 could have been prevented if we would have learned something from that um, not only the World Trade Centers but the coal two US embassies in Africa uh, Somalia uh, two, um, two apartment buildings that housed our uh, our military personnel in Saudi Arabia uh, Americans were dying and <clears throat> we probably should have learned something from that so I think there's a, a lot of blame that can go around for why 9-11 happened because there's certainly a lot of evidence there that we should have learned from. Uh, but my question is, how can we ensure information sharing? Uh, because we should have been sharing information before 9-11. And I know my own personal experience in whatever uh, position I've ever held where there were groups of people with individual responsibility uh, for different areas, they had a ter territorial um, view of things. So if we set up the Department of Homeland Security, we bring all these agencies under that umbrella, how can we ensure that they're going to share the information, and not only Homeland Security, but how can we get the FBI and the CIA to start sharing their information and stop trying to play these turf wars. Um, it should have happened way before 9-11, uh, and I would love to know how we can ensure it afterwards. And I, that's the question I... Uh, Mr. Lewis, as, as we speak uh, right now, the uh, bicameral uh, intelligence committees are meeting uh, and questioning a witness uh, uh, Richard Clark, who was uh, uh, until fairly recently the, the senior counterterrorism person in the White House uh, and still plays a role with respect to cyber terrorism uh, on what, you know, the lead up events to 9 11, what was looked into, what was worried about, and so forth. I just want to mention to you that that inquiry goes on, and the point of it is to look backward, to look forward, not just to find someone to blame or some administration to blame, but to learn the lessons, to learn what we missed so that we create for the future a much better capacity. Um, on your second point about information sharing, there is a bill that was introduced virtually unanimously by the uh, House Intelligence Committee, H.R. 4598, which would mandate uh, that we develop within six months a system to share information across the federal government. That means including the FBI and the CIA and whatever agencies are now in this new department and any others uh, across the federal government horizontally and then vertically between the federal government and local uh, responders, local first responders and American citizens, critical information about uh, terrorist threats. And the way this would be done is that that information would be stripped of uh, sources and methods of, of its classification uh, qualifications so that it could go out on our uh, law enforcement ne uh, networks like inlets the national law enforcement uh, um, uh, technology what Telecommun telecommunications system uh, called inlets uh, and we hope that that bill will, will uh, uh, proceed uh, through this chamber quickly and then will be taken up by the Senate uh, information sharing was a huge part of the problem and that's something that Congress can quickly fix thank you Flip. <coughs> Mr. Lewis, part of what we have to do is we have to have a procurement strategy that says that um, the east coast of one agency can't buy computers that don't talk to the west coast agency's computers. You can't have uh, a major place like the FBI not have email. You have to have 21st century technology, telecommunications, bandwidth. You have to have a complete amalgam of a new set of structures that are able to 
deal with portals that, that strip out pieces of information, that get down to the guy and the gal standing in a, in a booth at one of our borders, the information that says, this is the guy you're looking out for. I may not tell you everything you need to know, but if you see this person, this is the four-digit number you call, and, this is, and we'll be there in five minutes to get him. And we can do that. We do that in corporate America day in and day out. So part of what we do needs to be sure that we're not blowing money all over the place on a procurement strategy uh, that buys us stuff that isn't interoperable. We know that in the military, that is one of the key ingredients for our success. It is one of the ways we harmonize our ability to work with our coalition partners. Everybody's got a radio, looks the same, and they all talk on the same bandwidth. We have to do that in the federal government, too. And so part of this is to make sure that we're building an infrastructure that is 21st century responsive, can deal with privacy, can deal with secrets, can deal with making sure. But we have to take down these artificial firewalls that have basically also been computers and, and telecommunications so that people can get the information to the people that have to have it and they can act quickly. Mr. Lewis, let me just add one final thing, uh, if I may. The new Department of Homeland Security should be the keystone, if you will, among our intelligence gatherers. It's not a collection agency, it's an analytical agency. Uh, therefore, I think one of the questions you've asked raises the issue that I brought up in my testimony is, can the new Secretary of Homeland Security task these various agencies when he sees an issue based on his collective knowledge of all the information coming into him and sees a direction or a trend or a warning sign or an indicator, can he task agencies to be more specific and go after that information? Something we must work out in this legislation, but I think you've raised a, a very important issue here. Thank you. Mr. Tierney, thank you for your patience. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your leadership in having this uh, meeting today. Thank the members of the panel. Uh, I have two quick points I want to make before I ask a question. And, and one is, I know we talked earlier about uh, risk and threat assessment and its order and going forward here. And I agree, we have to move forward at least on both tracks. But I hope we don't uh, let that slide. I think it's critically important. And I was somewhat disappointed that the Governor Ridge did not have, when he came and met with our committee a while back, even the rudimentary aspects of a threat and risk assessment. We're going to need to know what those threats are that are identified and how they stack up against one another so that we can prioritize them and then have some way of putting this together. We may need, as Mr. Thornberry says, to make some amendments to this once we see that, and we may need to know how to allocate uh, the resources that will sure be asked for. It. Second point is, uh, Ms. Tauscher, you made a great point about the technology or whatever. I hope we're going to encourage the President to call upon the collective expertise of people in industry and entrepreneurs who are so uh, good at doing that type of thing. This is an effort uh, akin to World War II where the President called in uh, industry and asked for them to volunteer some time and expertise. I hope this President takes the leadership to do just that and to help us make sure that we find the right hardware and certainly the, the right software gets immediately uh, put together to do that. Because I know that your voices on that issue will, will weigh in and be considered with uh, appreciation by the White House. Uh, and just, uh, Ms. Harmon, let me start with you on the question that I had. Uh, we've been dealing a great deal with local emergency personnel, the first responders. How do you envision in this plan? I'm a, I look at the President's plan who talks about going through the states, and I know it raises some concern with my local first responders, I assume others, for that extra level of bureaucracy. Uh, do you envision, as we move forward with this legislation, that at least with respect to programs that have worked so well, like the COPS and the FIRE Act and others, that we can cut that level out and, and have these uh, federal resources go directly to the local responders? They're the ones that obviously have the fear and innovation and solutions right there on the front line. Well, you have to understand, uh, Mr. Tierney, that Governor Ridge as a former governor and President Bush as a former governor might have some affection for the governors of the 50 states. And of course, uh, Ellen Toucher and I love our governor, Governor Davis. But uh, I think the goal is to streamline whatever system is in the bill. Uh, the, the present idea, pre-Department uh, of Homeland Security, is to uh, get the $3.5 billion out to first responders going through the states, but the states are prohibited from holding on to more than 25% of the money. Uh, and 
Uh, whether that's an adequate system or not, I am not sure, but I am eager, as you are, to make sure our first responders have the best technology, the best training, and the best information that they can have. And that is why it is critical that we also uh, make sure that we mandate information sharing in a way that we can, um, because it is not happening adequately. Uh, just a final comment, every act of terrorism in America is local, and it's going to happen on somebody's real estate. Maybe it's going to happen on uh, uh, Eleanor's real estate here in uh, Washington, D.C., but it could as easily happen somewhere else. And so we must make sure that the resources we have to protect Americans wherever they live uh, are in place. And that is why, uh, if I had to prioritize, I would say getting money to Homeland to first uh, responders is, is paramount. One final comment. You, you talked about um, a threat assessment and a strategy. I know you know that I, I think uh, even when I'm home asleep, I talk about a threat assessment and a strategy. I'm not sure, however, that once we do this threat assessment, which is overdue, we should make it public. I wouldn't like to tell terrorists uh, what we're protecting and what we're protecting less. I think that might be uh, a very bad idea. Matt. Uh, Mr. Tierney, I think that this relationship between the federal government and the state and local first responders is one of the most important features of this whole proposal. Right now, you have several offices around the government who have some responsibility for helping out in the case of an emergency or in training uh, to prepare for an emergency. What, what our bill and the President's bill tries to do is bring those together so that those relationships, like that FEMA has, 10 regional offices around the country, uh, can be the primary method of communication, and so you get used to dealing with those folks. And they help do the training. They're also the people you call when you have an emergency. Uh, and, and so you develop those relationships with the federal and state and local folks so that you have one phone number to call rather than a phone book to try to look up the number of who it is you're supposed to call when such and such happens. And, and bring that together, having the coordination and integration for that intergovernmental relationship, I think will be of enormous benefit for any kind of emergency, natural or otherwise. Well, I appreciate that. And I just hope that you know, we're talking about getting it straight down. If we can get rid of one level of bureaucracy, and it has not necessarily worked well that the money stops at the state and, and fully one quarter gets chopped off. I don't think that's a great plan. The money's been very, very slow getting to the local communities, uh, especially those that have put out a billion and a half dollars collectively since September 11th and have yet to get any a reinforcement for that, nor have they gotten any sign yet that we're going to, as a group and the White House together, give them any credit for that by softening up the matching requirement as they go forward. And you know as well as I, most of our states and local communities are strapped right now, and I think we can help them in a number of ways by looking at those issues. I didn't mean to cut you off, Ms. Tasha. No, uh, Mr. Tierney, we need a Marshall Plan uh, for our relationships around the world, but we need a Manhattan Project to get this telecommunications bandwidth and communications uh, computerization thing worked out because it's been a nightmare uh, heretofore, the kind of procurement strategies that different agencies use. We need someone that is, frankly, like an orchestra conductor. Uh, and we need to really engage the private sector, uh, certainly in California and in your state, Massachusetts, and around the world, to say that this is an imperative uh, that when we're analyzing and archiving information, that it can actually be put into bite-sized, securitized pieces so that the people that have to do the functionary jobs, whether they're first responders or border patrol, just collecting information from hospital emergency rooms uh, to make sure that if somebody sees somebody with bumps on them, that it's that it really is the chicken pox, not smallpox. All of this stuff needs to be done, and it needs to be done now. And that's why we have to have a procurement strategy, not only so we do it right, but we sit on, so we don't waste the money that the American people think that we're going to. Mr. Turney, let me add uh, my thought here as well. Uh, I couldn't agree more that our uh, city and local responders need uh, assistance, and they need it quickly. Uh, but no doubt about it, uh, when you look at every state, some of the first responders are not local or community organizations. They happen to be state organizations as well. So whether the division of resources, 25% uh, to the state, 75% to local and community responders is adequate, I think Congress will look at that and make that determination and, and assign maybe a fast track to get the, or get the resources down to those local communities. But again, uh, I go back to what Mr. Putnam said. Uh, <clears throat> 
National Guard is a state agency, and it is, will be one of our first responders, as we saw uh, during uh, the September 11th and post-September 11th events. Uh, you cannot cut state out altogether. They've got to be a part of this. Uh, ultimately, the decision tree uh, can be uh, streamlined, I hope, uh, as you've suggested as well. Thank you, Mr. Hutter. Thank you for your patience. Uh, thank uh, you for thank staying. You. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your leadership uh, on this very important and obviously complex uh, issue. There's just a couple of things that I'd like to start with, and I don't mean to begin a bantering process here between the panel and the, and the committee members, but, uh, uh, you know, when I take a look, I, I believe in some cases we do have a Marshall Plan. Uh, in fact, I think we maybe even came perilously close to creating martial law uh, in this country. And if we're not careful uh, with how fast we go with our great enthusiasm, uh, that we may do just that. And as far as the Manhattan Project goes, uh, you know, it was interesting. When they put that together, they, uh, they were not quite sure if they were going to succeed. But nobody was studying what happens if they were successful. And if we had been studying what happens if they're successful in achieving their goals under the Manhattan Project, we probably would have stopped a 60 years Cold War because we knew we would, we would control those massive devices of destruction if, uh, if we had said to ourselves at that same time, what happens if we're really successful here? One of the uh, things that I would like to engage in with the panel, and I haven't heard it, and as I've searched through this, I haven't seen it, and that is the uh, participation of uh, the individual. Uh, we've got committees, and we've got uh, directors, and we've got secretaries, and it goes uh, on and on and on. And uh, I, I'm, I'm just concerned that whenever the government gets a profile, and this committee gets a profile, and this act gets a profile, that uh, 282 million Americans <clears throat> are going to say, well, uh, somebody's handling it. I don't have to worry about it. And too often, that's exactly what happens. And so as I've searched through the appointments and the directors, I have seen nothing in this bill that says, here's how we're going to activate 282 million citizen patriots. Because what we need here is not a neighborhood watch. We need a nation watch. And they need to be able to respond, uh, I believe, when they when they see something that uh, obviously looks out of the ordinary. And perhaps your 911 on a nation level uh, will, will answer uh, part of that. Uh, the other thing that uh, really concerns me was the response that we got to Mr. Putnam's question relative to, to domestic terrorism. Uh, we do have domestic terrorists. And especially out west, uh, we're, we're very aware of them. Uh, uh, there are people that uh, purposely destroy property, in some cases have, have sent pipe bombs and letter bombs uh, to executives at corporations that they disagreed with their uh, corporate mission and that sort of thing. And we've done precious little uh, to stop that sort of terrorism. We know their names. Yet, in my, in my other uh, committee, the Natural Resources Committee, uh, we had a member of uh, ALF come before the committee and took the Fifth Amendment 105 times. The very constitutional protection that he exerted in that committee, he denied to everybody and to their private property that he assailed. So the, we, we have eco-terrorism going on in the United States right now, and there can be ever bit as a damaging. In fact, through the uh, chairman's leadership, a while back we got a uh, pretty good look into uh, some of the terrorism that was planned against the United States during the Second World War. Uh, when a, a plot was uncovered to send arsonists from both Germany and Japan to the United States and set our forest fires, uh, uh, set our forest afire, not unlike what's going on in Colorado and some of our other sister states today. And so I think that we need to take a look back to uh, Flight 93 on the morning of 9-11, a flight that was headed from New York right straight to San Francisco. And when we informed, when those people became informed on that flight uh, that uh, they didn't have very many alternatives, when they had the information, they acted. So those were the first citizen patriots, I believe, that this country saw. And I believe that we need to assume that same responsibility that they did. I would be in hopes that someplace in this act, 
uh, we would find a, a encouragement and enthusiasm uh, for the individual's responsibility to, number one, be responsible for their own freedom. Number two, their family's freedom, and then it grows into the communities, and then, yes, the cities, the counties, and the states as it goes on. But let's not deny the most massive force that we've got. Uh, when Osama bin Laden and so damn insane, or Saddam Hussein, figures out uh, that he's got he's to defeat 282 million Americans that love their freedom, they're going to say, this is a ship we got at sea. It's never going to find a port, I believe. And so I would hope that we would, uh, uh, that we would encourage that. There are a couple of things that I want to speak to here in my time's already up. Sections, uh, primarily, as I've gone through the act, uh, and maybe you could do this later, section 108, which is the good faith, as long as the individual in the agency is acting in good faith, they can't be held personally responsible for what they may do to a citizen's civil liberties. The section, section uh, 302, uh, the immunity provisions, whatever, Whatever immunities they had before, they carry with them. I think if they're going to be responsible for enforcing a law like this, they ought to understand it, and they ought to understand where their limitations are. And, uh, Mr. Chairman, I made the speech instead of asking the question. Well, I you apologize know, for that. No, you don't need to apologize. You've been thinking about this for a long time, and you've been waiting in this hearing. I'd be happy to have this committee just address that was in your legislation, not the President's. The President has submitted his bill. But would you like to, each of you, just comment on that, and then we'll go to Ms. Watson. Mr. Chairman, if I could just, in, in summary, what our bill tries to do is take existing agencies and existing authorities and bring them together in a more co coordinated and coherent fashion. We are not trying to create new exemptions or new powers for, for uh, uh, federal employees. We're trying to bring them together. And so our draft is, is an attempt to reflect uh, authority that is already in law. Uh, and, and of course, you're right that the strength of this country is in the citizens, uh, not in its, its uh, in, in, in other things. That's, that's what we have uh, that is most important. I guess I just want to emphasize we're not trying to do everything. We're not trying to uh, marshal all the resources here. What we're simply trying to do is realign government agencies in a way to make the country safer. Uh, that's the focus, uh, and, and I think that, the, the, that this proposal does that. And I would just add to that that I think the empowered individual is at the center of this legislation and at the center of the way we can protect our country in the future from terrorist acts. I mean, a terrorist act is, is designed to inflict terror. If we have a prepared public that understands what it's supposed to do and can take individual precautions um, the, to protect the, the individual, the family, the community, and so forth, then terrorism will fail. And the structure that the administration has come up with, particularly the piece, the, the blue piece on the right, you know, the analytical capability, I think is designed to get good information to first responders and to individual citizens so that they can take responsibility uh, to prevent the attacks in their own uh, communities. And I think that's a, a great thing we can do as a government to help individual freedom. And uh, I certainly support the thrust of your comments. So, Ms. Watson, thank you for your patience. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you so much for this hearing. Uh, I really think that we're going about this all the wrong way. I feel that what we need to do, and as had just been said, is work on a coordinated function, have a separate research group that would do nothing but concentrate on what Homeland Security is all about, then come up with a proposal that will pull out provisions from other departments. Just taking departments and throwing them all under one head is not going to solve our problem. You're going to have personnel problems uh, with status and so on. We've got to set aside a budget. This is not going to pay for itself by the budgets that are already in these departments. But I think we need a separate unit that does nothing but research and come up with a proposal. It might take us one year, two years, or three years. But in the meantime, it's the coordinated effort. How can you have a department without the CIA and the FBI part of it? 
the reason for the establishment of the CIA is to gather intelligence. And they need to be under this pinnacle. So I think moving real quickly to make one huge, massive department called Homeland Security is the wrong way to go. I think the coordinated effort is the right way to go at this time, and then give some time to a select committee to put a proposal in front of us. Can I have comments on that, please? Uh, Ms. Watson, let me make a couple of comments, and then I'm sure others will want to join in. Um, in order to get coordination, you've got to bring some of these agencies together under one chain of command. In other words, Governor Ridge has been trying to do this from the White House for several months. He, ha he does not have the ability to make the Coast, and I'm using a simple example, the Coast Guard radios compatible with the Border Patrol radios. You've got to bring them together in one department so there's a guy at the top who has control over their money and says, do this. And until you get that direct chain of command with the money that goes with it, you will not have the kind of coordination uh, which, which I believe we need. And, and let me make, uh, just to address one other point briefly. Uh, we have a CIA for lots of reasons, to collect intelligence for foreign activity, for threats that may be happening in India and Pakistan, for example, uh, things that are happening in Africa, drugs in South America, they ha they're collecting intelligence all over the world for a variety of purposes. What the President's proposal does is say, okay, we'll get together the information collected by the CIA and the FBI and other intelligence agencies, and we'll look at it with a new set of eyes, looking at it from a homeland security perspective. In other words, it's the analysis, look, thinking about homeland security from that perspective that is new and different, and I think is a major step forward here. I endorse those comments, but I would just point out uh, to you, Diane, that we have done the research. Uh, that was called the Hart Rudman Commission and the Bremer Commission and the Gilmore Commission. They looked at these things. The federal government spent uh, uh, real money. Senator Rudman just told me that it cost that the uh, Hart Rudman uh, uh, cost twelve million dollars, and I just told him I'm not sure he was worth it. But um, uh, humor aside, uh, they have seriously studied these issues, and the recommendations that we are dealing with today grow out of a. Uh, uh, a recent history of really serious and focused research to arrive at this result. This uh, new proposal doesn't cover every function of government, as we've said, and it is a variation on legislation that all four of us uh, have co-sponsored and support uh, that would have these functions arrayed slightly differently, but we all feel strongly that these functions do have to be attended to in some organized format. Otherwise, you won't get the result, which is uh, increased homeland security. Very briefly, uh, while I join my colleagues in their comments as well, you've raised the issue of why this is such a difficult task, and that is because we have so many turf wars that we're going to have to deal with both here in Congress as well as in the administration is, is clearly uh, evident to all of us and each of us as we've gone through this whole process. Uh, what we're after is to streamline. We're, we're after to make more efficient those agencies which have a role in Homeland Security, which are disparate now. They're spread out among other agencies. So what, what concerns us when we see these uh, separate agencies and separate responsibilities is that focus among those agencies may not be on the most important task for the defense of America within that bigger agency. Uh, in the transportation uh, department, you have the Coast Guard. Uh, is it the uh, Secretary of Transportation's primary focus to worry about the safety of America, or is it to worry about how the infrastructure of America functions uh, to keep our economy going, which is just as big a an issue in this country? We want to simply streamline by removing some of these various agencies that have a role and put them in to a, a clearer focus agency whose role is for single purpose uh, homeland security. And you're absolutely correct, it is going to cause some heartache um, among some of these larger agencies when they start seeing parts, relative parts, representative parts of their not only department, but budgets go with them over to this uh, new agency. Uh, it's something we will have to work on. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be quick, but we have to do it. Perhaps if we talked about 
who was moving that would be helpful. Um, there are some over 100,000 people now when you include the Transportation Security Administration uh, in 40 different departments of the federal government that have terrorism or counterterrorism in the first line of their job description. And they are underneath this kudzu blanket in many different departments that have primary functions to do other things. They are nice to have in many cases in big departments that have primary jobs to do important things for commerce, for um, our environment, for the people of America. But they are over here. And what we need to do to make sure that once we get this CIA, FBI, analytical and archiving and advising and alerting function moving, you've got to have people in a place with someone that's going to tell them what to do, with the budget authority to get it done, with the right set of tools to accomplish what needs to be done to prevent and prepare for tax. And that's, we're not, we're not just picking people and moving them because they, they, they're in this building or that office. These are people that already have functions that are about terrorism and counterterrorism. But they're working for other people, and they're not always the most important people in that building, and they're not always getting the budget and the authority they need. So this is an effort to move them into a place so that they get the kind of attention they need. Now, my colleagues are right. Because of the atmosphere we have now, these are the people that are probably going to get more money in different departments than some other people are, and it's going to be hard to separate them from, from their, the leadership that they have now. Everybody wants the people that are the um, flavor of the week or the budgetary issue of the week. So we know this is going to be difficult. But unless we take down these firewalls and unless we put them in one place and hold people accountable and responsible for what they do and give them the tools and equipment they need and the budget authority they need, we're never going to get to the place where we can prepare and prevent. And that's why I think this bill is very important. Just a comment. Uh, I couldn't agree with uh, the four of you more. I think the coordinated function is what is essential at the current time. The establishment of a new department, I think we need to go beyond the Rudman report so that it is uh, essential and relevant to what is needed in today's climate. And I think that's what's going to take the time. And then how do we allocate the budget? We cannot just pick up the cost of running a particular agency and put it over here. Uh, we're going to have to do more in-depth thinking about how we do that. And uh, we're just going to have to all agree it's going to cost us to develop this new department. Over the weekend, the news was it's not going to cost us anything. We're going to pick up the budget. That's unrealistic. We ought to go ahead and dedicate the money. We ought to deal with the coordinated function right now and the development of, because we've got personnel issues that are going to just be the biggest challenges we ever had. We've got to move people around. They now, who have the authority to make all the decisions at the top, are going to be answering to somebody else. And so it needs to be thought through very, very carefully and at a depth level that I haven't heard yet. But I think the coordinated function has to happen yesterday. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Let me uh, just tell the panel, they've been very patient. We have four more people. We have uh, Mr. Platts, then we have Mr. Davis, and Ms. Morella, and then myself. And I'm just going to ask you some general questions. Hopefully, you'll be able to stay for all of the four who remain. Um, and then to s tell you that we have a very patient person, the $12 million man, Senator Rudman, worth every penny. Uh, Mr. Platts. Actually, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to be very brief and just say uh, one uh, thanks to you and to our panelists for today's uh, testimony. And, and I, I think one of the really important messages has come is here at the table of the bicameral, bipartisan agreement that we need to act fast. We, we can have some differences on the specifics as we move forward to iron out, but the imperative nature of this, uh, this need and uh, very much appreciate the efforts, not just today, but over the past months and years, really, that you, you all have been working on this, and uh, certainly uh, your leadership, Mr. Chairman, on this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I, too, want to commend you for your leadership on the issue. And I also want to thank the 
panel for their generosity in terms of the time that they've been able to spend. <coughs> I was very interested in, in, in the question raised by Mr. Lewis when we talk about the lack of coordination or the amount of coordination and information sharing and how do we really cause that to happen. I, I was appreciative of the answers that were given relative to greater use of technology, how we really bring that together, and also the development of a procurement strategy that is laced into the issue. And I guess the, the question that I would further pursue would be how much legislative direction are we going to be willing to give a new agency? I, I mean, those are human elements, those are management tools and systems and things that are used, but I also think that there has to be a rather clear legislative intent or legislative direction that is given. The, the other thought that I had, it seemed like my friend and I from Idaho were thinking somewhat alike in terms of trying to figure out with all that we're talking about, how much training or how do we, we come up with a way to seriously involve the citizenry in, in, first of all, the development of a mindset relative to prevention, relative to detection, and then emergency response. I mean, how do we respond as a citizenship or a citizenry should there be a, another disaster? Yeah. And, and, and so I'd just like to hear yeah. some comments relative to that. And again, Mr. Chairman, Mr. I, I appreciate your leadership on this issue. Mr. Davis, let me just speak to information sharing first. I'm not sure you were here when uh, at least I mentioned a bill, H.R. 4598, which is um, supported, I, I think, unanimously by the House Intelligence Committee and a number of other uh, uh, of our colleagues, on a, you know, obviously on a bipartisan basis, that would mandate information sharing uh, about terrorist threats across the federal government and then vertically between the federal government and local responders. And the reason uh, we think this legislation is critical now is that it does cover the CIA and the FBI and all the functions that that could go into this uh, new Department of Homeland Security. The CIA and FBI won't go there, so this is a bill broader than uh, just information sharing between this agency and local responders. Uh, and the, the notion is that within six months we would develop a system through existing channels to share critical threat information stripped of sources and methods. It's classification. That way it can go to the broad population of first responders, many of whom don't have security clearances. That's on your first point. On the second point about an informed citizenry, um, Ellen Toucher and I are from California, um, the land of earthquakes. And I think it is probably true that 98% of Californians know to, what to do in the event of an earthquake. And I think that's the kind of place we have to get to with this. I'm old enough to remember the civil defense drills of the 50s. Our goal here is to provide information to empower individuals to know what to do. If they know what to do, they won't panic. And if they don't panic, we will severely limit, this is good, the amount of casualties that occur in the event that we're not able to protect against uh, a future terrorist attack. The whole issue of a procurement strategy, I think, is an important one because um, there is going to be a tremendous amount of money expended in order to connect this agency to the rest of the world, um, especially to first responders so that they can act in a responsible way. Um, I, I hesitate to, to have, I think mandates are a bad thing, but I think that prescriptive outcomes are the kinds of things that we want to look at in legislation, uh, things that are very clear about the kinds of coordination, the kinds of abilities for telecommunication bandwidth to be secured, for um, to, to basically say over and over again as often as we can, and to have the legislation have the outcome that we want, which is that the people that need to get the information to act, to archive, to advise, to alert, 
get it in a timely manner that they are empowered to do it that they are trained and that we have uh, at the same time to the ability to, pr to deal with privacy issues secrecy issues and obviously civil liberty issues so I think it's very important that we are prescriptively outcomes based not mandating go by this or go by that and Mr. Davis, one uh, quick comment to join with my colleagues here. I agree with what they have said. And uh, in 1947, we had one of the previous massive reorganizations of mass of United States government. We have, in Congress, every year since then, struggled with the idea of how to appropriately fund them, how to give them direction uh, that we constantly deal with on a year in, a year out basis. I don't believe that as we go down this road, any of us are under the misconception that we're going to solve all of the problems with the beginning of this. We're going to have to work at this as we go through it uh, time and time again, as, as you well know from your many years here. Uh, we constantly try to iron out the wrinkles, uh, and each time we do, we create a wrinkle in some other part of the fabric. But we're going to continually work on this because we believe that it's in the best interest of the uh, American citizens that we go forward with this issue. Much, Mr. Chairman, and the only thing I'd say is that um, about the only thing that I don't find desirable about California is its earthquakes, and so we'll be looking to you for leadership. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mr. Davis. <laughs> Ms. Morella. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, I thank you for holding this uh, joint subcommittee. It's very important. I thank my colleagues for being here and being patient and presenting not only the legislation but responding to the questions. Um, my question is that I know that the administration is asking for significant flexibility in the hiring process. Um, also looking for flexibility in compensation systems and practices. Given the battle that has been waged over federalizing those airport screeners, where do you all stand on sidestepping federal worker union pay scales and grievance procedures. Ms. Marilla, I think our intention is not to take on other battles in this legislation. Uh, now, what, what, as I mentioned a while ago, our in goal is to take existing agencies and realign them in ways that make more sense. Uh, so that they can be coordinated and so that they can have the proper focus and, and so they can have the prior, uh, uh, proper uh, set of priorities. Uh, now, there are some issues in the administration's proposal which we have not seen the language yet. I don't know exactly what they mean, so I, there's no way for us to comment on what they have in mind. Uh, and we'll have to go through those. But, but again, I don't think this is the place generally to change substantive law about immigration or other things. Uh, this is the place to try to improve the organization of the government so we can make the country safer. I agree with those comments. I would just add that uh, at least this member does not want to interfere with uh, longstanding uh, principles like collective bargaining. Uh, I think there will be a way, um, if we are all uh, flexible and focused on the goal of preventing the next wave of attacks, to work this out and preserve the protections that we have in federal law. Um, this is not the place to fight that fight. Uh, I don't happen to think it should be fought, but at any rate, this is the place to integrate various functions of government uh, that at the moment aren't integrated and because they're not integrated can't connect the, the dots or build the blueprint to protect us against the na next wave of attacks. Ms. Morell, I would agree. I think uh, this fight is uh, completely uh, outside of the realm of uh, the personnel issues uh, that Congress has already spoken about and has passed legislation regarding. I think if Congress wishes to test or to change those, then it would uh, be a separate, a separate subject uh, by which uh, not necessarily this committee, but uh, someone in Congress will, will bring up and, and we'll have to deal with those issues then. We're simply here trying, as uh, Ms. Harmon has said, to streamline and uh, make more efficient uh, our intelligence capabilities uh, and agency efficiencies uh, within our government. Ms. Morella, I'm with my colleagues. Uh, I am certainly not for um, abrogating or rolling back any of the uh, civil uh, 
employee rights for either collective bargaining or anything under the rubric of flexibility. Um, I, I think that we need to be very flexible and we need to be very steadfast. But as a member of the Transportation Committee, I can tell you that we have lots of legislation that's being held up right now from floor votes because of Davis-Bacon. And we need to have state revolving funds for water recycling and a bunch of other things that have gotten bollocked up because of an issue that would pass a floor vote, but what certain parts of leadership won't allow to come to the floor. And, and I think that my colleagues and I are very firmly uh, and hope with agreement with everyone else that we don't want ancillary issues that are going to delay our ability to do what's right for the American people that are basically inside stories here in Washington uh, that are very partisan, frankly. We don't want them to come up. We want them to be put to the side so that we can do the right thing, and we're hoping we'll get all of everyone's support on that. I appreciate your responses. I just want to bring that up because I think it's critically important that we think of the people who are there and on whom we are going to be depending to make sure we do not abrogate uh, any of the privileges and rights they have. And since, uh, Ms. Tausche, you mentioned transportation, there is a case in point. You've got the TSA. I mean, you're supposed to, by November, be federalize the uh, screeners and uh, uh, the you know, airport passengers. How is that going to work out being melded into this new homeland security? It is a problem. I don't know whether you have any answers, but I pose this as something we need to look at. Well, I, you know, I think that there is a lesson from the creation of the TSA, which was done, um, I think, without a lot of a broadband consultation um, that was held up on an issue very similar to what we're talking about here uh, that caused a lot of things to happen that potentially are terrible unintended consequences. Um, we've got tremendous problems in California to be able to hire screeners because many of our screeners are um, not American citizens but are certainly here legally. Uh, so we have a lot of issues about TSA that I think are lessons to be learned. Um, I don't want to repeat of that, but I don't think we should um, spend any time at all shrinking back from that experience. I think we have to learn from it, but I think the lesson in that is that the best work that we do here is bipartisan and bicameral. And that's why I think it's very, very important that we keep the openness that we've been able to achieve so far and not get ourselves into little rooms where people are not talking to each other and where these unintended consequences grow very, very quickly. Ms. Morell, if I could add one brief point. If, if you see the chart in the President's material, Transportation Security Administration comes in block. All of the people, the rules, the regulations that we've already adopted come as a block. Coast Guard comes in block. Now, there's a new Cabinet Secretary at the top, but uh, we don't dismantle either of them and reassemble them in some way. They come as they are in block. Uh, inside a new cabinet department. So I, I think a lot of these understandable concerns about substantive changes inside the agencies are, are not what any of us, including the president, have in mind. Thank the gentlelady. I, um, as I've listened to the incredibly thoughtful questions of this committee and of these committees, I've noted the enthusiasm that the members have and also their caution and I think both are appropriate. I think that we've heard about no traps, no hidden agendas with this legislation. And I was struck by the fact as I was looking, particularly at my four colleagues who are before us right now, how grateful I would be as president, if I were president, to be able to know that you all are leading the charge with him. Republican and Democrat, uh, very thoughtful members. Um, I particularly like your comment, Mr. Gibbons, of uh, reaching in and trying to put a puzzle together and everybody going into separate rooms. I mean, we have a list of a majority of those departments and agencies just listed on those two tables. And if, if we were to deal with that issue, we'd have to bring them all in. And I look at the proposal that's been outlined by the President's folks not in statutory language, and think, you know, it's probably good that that didn't happen yet. It's good that we had this hearing and we could talk more generally and not about the specific detail that will follow to just kind of, I think, help guide you all as you help the president draft this legislation to stay away from some of those traps. 
And I, I just have to say to you, I find the President's proposal um, that built on the, the, on the $12 million man's proposal uh, and your proposal, uh, I find it is elegant in, frankly, in its simplicity and its ability, though, to bring it all together, to bring all of it in under one, in some cases under direct control, in some cases as an active customer demanding that the intelligence come not just from the CIA, but the DEA and all the, the law enforcement agents, even from the local police departments, will be able to feed into that blue column. Um, so I, um, I'm just very grateful you all are here and would, would only ask, is there any question that you think should have been asked that you want to ask yourself that you want to put on the record? If not, I will also say you started a new first. We had no statements by the part in the committee. And um, my uh, colleague, um, Mr. Weldon, Dr. Weldon said, let's not read our statements uh, before Mr. Rudman. Uh, let's forego the statements. I want you to know I had a great statement. <laughs> and uh, I'm not going to read it, but I'm going to read one paragraph and a half. And it, uh, it was in another age, in the face of another mortal challenge to our serenity and sovereignty, President Abraham Lincoln advised Congress. And this was what he said. The dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. The occasion is piled high with difficulty, and we must rise with the occasion. As our case is new, so we must think anew and act anew. We must disenthrall ourselves, and then we shall save our country. That's what Abraham Lincoln said. So I would say at this moment in history, saving our country requires bold action to reshape and refocus the instruments of government's most fundamental responsibility, defense of life and liberty. Last week, the President proposed that bold action, in my opinion, because of the work that you all have done. Thank you all very much. I'm going to have you move over one. Put him under Gibbons. Have him move one over. Jason. While we're waiting to set up, I just would ask unanimous consent, a householding issue here, household issue. I ask unanimous consent that all members of the subcommittee be permitted to place an opening statement in the record and that that record remain open for three days for that purpose, without objection so ordered. I ask for the unanimous consent that all witnesses be permitted to include their written statements in the record without objection so ordered. Jason, can we move those mics a little further away, the other ones? Just get them out of the way. Why don't you bring him on the floor, Jason? Jason, just take him off the floor. So just put him on the floor. Thank you, my friend. Mr. Redman, I, I had this particular amount of admiration and glee. Never have we kept a senator waiting so long. But I would, like the, I would like the record to state that we gave you the opportunity to uh, be in the back room or come later. And um, to your credit, you said you wanted to listen to the comments of our colleagues. And um, that makes your testimony, frankly, more valuable, having uh, you hear the questions of the committee already and uh, have heard their statements. You, I think, rightfully deserve to be by yourself. You have been uh, working with others, admittedly, but you have been at the forefront of trying to get this country to wake up to the terrorist threat. And you had uh, proposed uh, uh, bold programs. Uh, and uh, we are uh, coming to see the wisdom of those proposals. So uh, welcome. And um, we uh, now are prepared to hear your statement. Mr. Chairman, uh, Chairman Weldon, uh, members of the committee, thank you uh, for inviting me. Uh, I am delighted that the day has come that you are having a hearing on the consolidation that we recommended several years ago. Uh, just a brief uh, historical note for those who may not be familiar with our work. 
this Congress, mainly the House of Representatives in 1997, uh, at the urging of President Clinton and former Speaker Gingrich, decided that national security for the 21st century ought to be looked at in every aspect. The Pentagon, the State Department, education, science, and of course, terrorism. Uh, at the end of that three and a half year period, to the surprise of everyone on that panel, our risk assessment, our threat assessment, concluded that the single greatest threat to this country was what happened on September 11th. And I have asked the staff to place on your uh, places uh, a copy of this chart, which is page 17 of our final report, which bears a striking similarity to what has been produced by the President. Uh, the reason we did this is because our risk assessment told us that we were not organized to meet the threats. And what we did in many ways had a striking similarity to what President Truman and George Catlett Marshall did in 1947 and 48. Uh, uh, there are very few people around who remember uh, what happened back then, but what happened was that there was an army, and there was a navy, and there was an OSS. There was no Joint Chiefs of Staff. The Air Force was part of the army, and the State Department was organized totally differently than it is today. Out of that study came the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the Department of Defense. What is being recommended here in many ways is very similar to that. There are more pieces. What the President has said is let's take all of these functions which have a similar goal, protecting the homeland, protecting the borders, protecting, responding, preserving, put them in an agency that has one directorate. Let them keep their identities. Let them do what they've always done, but maybe do it better. Do it with more coordination, more direction. Uh, for the benefit of those who are not familiar with our work, in that three and a half years, we spent enormous amounts of time with some of the, the world leading authorities on all of these issues. We had extensive briefings from all of our people in the government, as well as foreign governments. We met with allies and adversaries. Uh, we had testimony from CIA, DIA, FBI, the academics who work in these fields for years. And so I would say to uh, Ms. Watson that I think that the threat assessment you will find in volume one and two, which was part of our charge from the Congress, tells you the prioritization of what we think the threats are. For instance, we say clearly that the threat this country faces today is totally asymmetric. It has nothing to do whatsoever with the huge Army, Navy, Marine Corps, Air Force that we have. It has a lot to do, a lot to do with transnational threats from both state-sponsored terrorism and non-state-sponsored terrorism. And we're not quite sure what September 11th was yet, but right now we think it's Al-Qaeda, but who knows whether in the future intelligence could uncover there were state connections. We don't know that. Now, let me simply say that I've heard a lot of questions about intelligence here. And as I know that you know, Mr. Chairman, I served on Senate Intelligence and chaired the PIFIAB, or vice chaired it for the last nine years. Um, this is not going to solve your intelligence problems. That's separate. I hope that these committees that are now hearing this, that uh, Congresswoman Harmon spoke of, that these hearings will start to address that. But do not expect this to address the intelligence problem. It goes a, a way president's proposal to establish an analytic section, but, and that will help. But if there are major intelligence problems, this was not designed by the president to solve those problems. It was designed for a totally different reason, to take those parts of border security, protection and response and prevention, and put them in one place. We commend it. We agree with it. But I would only add that I have yet to see a major piece of legislation that came to Congress from a president that was improved by the time it got to the president's desk for signing. I'm sure 
that Congress will come up with ideas to improve this. And you'll work these out with the administration. But we, we fully support this. I've talked to most members of the commission. Incidentally, the commission was allocated $12 million. It spent $10 million. The members of the commission did their work totally pro bono. Uh, all of the money that was spent was spent on a first-class staff over a period of three and a half years. Do we need an investigation of what happened to the, I don't two, think so. to the two million? I think the GAO has a total record if you want to look at how the money was spent. It was spent wisely and, and I think fairly, uh, uh, fairly well. Uh, I don't have much else to say uh, except to say I'm pleased to answer your questions. Uh, what the President did was to add to our recommendation of 18 months ago three key elements. Transportation uh, Security Agency, which didn't exist at the time that this was written. The INS, which uh, uh, we thought of putting in here but didn't, and m maybe that's the right thing to do. An analytical section for intelligence and the Secret Service and I believe uh, the labs, uh, which I don't fully understand yet, but I'm sure there's a reason. Let me answer in advance one question that was asked to the panel. Uh, in our recommendation, when we said the custom service, we specified it was the law enforcement part of custom service. We did not think that the revenue raising part of the custom service need be transferred. So I think the Congress working with the administration can probably work out some carve-outs of certain parts of agencies which might want to stay where they are. But when you look at the history and you look at the Coast Guard being in transportation and, and you look at border security uh, being in justice and, and you look at Secret Service being at the Treasury and law enforcement customs being in the Treasury, you say, you know, these were done for reasons 30, 40, 50, 75 years ago. Today, the function has to be followed by the organization, or vice versa, if you wish. That's what the President's proposed. We support it, and we hope the Congress will work its will and produce a first-class piece of legislation that will give this country protection. A final word, I think, to uh, Chairman Weldon and to my dear friend Joe Lieberman. I wish I shared your optimism about the future. I think that with new organization, with improved intelligence, we can probably prevent a great many terrorist acts from taking place in this country. But I do not believe that it would be logical to think that we can prevent them all. Uh, the Israelis have tried mightily with their incredible intelligence and they have been unable to. The British, during the Northern Ireland situation, tried with their intelligence and couldn't. There is something uniquely horrible about terrorism compared to conventional warfare, in that it is so hard to determine what's in the minds of people. I'm fond of saying that in baseball, if you bat 500, you're in the Hall of Fame. In intelligence, if you bat 750, you're a loser. And we're going to lose some of these battles. I wish I felt otherwise, but I will tell you, Chairman Weld, that I've seen far too much information over the last nine years to believe that we can prevent it all. But we can go a long way from preventing a great deal of it, and that ought to be our goal. Our goal ought to be 100 percent. That's what our goal ought to be. But I think that to anticipate we can do that and that we fail greatly if we don't is to raise expectations probably more than we probably should. Take your questions. Thank you for that very um, heartfelt and thorough statement. I appreciate it. But Dr. Weldon, you're starting. And then we'll go to you, Mr. Costa. Thank you, Senator. Um, I certainly uh, agree with you that our goal should be to prevent uh, all acts of terrorism against our homeland, and nothing short of that should be our goal. Um, my comments related to Senator Lieberman's comments really were a reflection of what I think is uh, an attitude on the part of some people that uh, it's inevitable. And I think if we do everything we possibly can, um, that's our obligation, our responsibility, and we need to pursue that, and we need to make our goal not a single additional uh, attack will occur. Can, I agree. Can, can we sit here and say, even if we enact the President's request and
put all the resources, financial resources and logistical resources behind the agency uh, that we will succeed. Nobody knows, only the good Lord knows that. Um, I, I would like your comment on the question I asked the first panel about uh, um, reorganizing the Congress to respond to the challenge. Um, and, and I see that as really two issues. The, the permanent committee concept where we would have in the House and in the Senate a Committee on Homeland Security to oversee this new cabinet agency, um, which I think is something that perhaps we do not need to act on immediately, but it's something we need to very seriously consider. But my other overriding concern is I'm told there are some 66 committees in the House and the Senate that have a piece, a jurisdictional piece of this issue. And if we are going to get this done before we adjourn for the for the fall campaign, um, I, I just don't know how we can move something this big through all those respective committees. And I personally would favor some um, some sort of effort to streamline the committee referral process um, so that it will make it more possible for us to get it enacted into law. Mm -hmm. We gave a great deal of thought to that. And let me tell you what we said. Uh, recommendation. Uh, uh, number 48 of 50, Congress should rationalize its current committee structure so that it best serves U.S. national security objectives. Specifically, it should merge the current authorized committees and the relevant appropriation committees. So that is quite a statement coming from an ex-appropriator, but that's what we believe. We went on in the body of this text to do exactly what you are speaking of. I'm not sure you can get through the creation without multi-committee structure. I mean, it's just too much history there, uh, too many people that have great interest in these agents they, they've been looking over for years. But I do believe that once it is done, you cannot have a secretary who's gonna come up here and talk to 30, 40, 50, 60 subcommittees. I mean, I, if that's the case, he better have a wonderful deputy secretary because he'll really be running the agency. Uh, I think you ought to have a select committee like intelligence. I mean, you've got an armed services committee. This this is a homeland defense committee that you ought to permit. And, and we do recommend in here that the members ought to be picked from those committees that have experience with the issues, such as intelligence, armed forces, uh, uh, you call it something else here, uh, foreign relations, uh, appropriations, uh, and a representative committee that every committee would feel it was represented on the select committee. I mean, that that's what we recommend. I'm running out of time, I did have a follow-up question um, about the FBI. Do you make any recommendations in your report regarding the FBI? Um, I think it was Senator Lieberman might have been the one who recommended bringing the FBI into this agency. Yeah, I think there'll be a terrible mistake. We did not spend a great deal of time on that in this report. I will tell you why. Uh, I've had a lot of experience with the FBI both before I came to the here when I was Attorney General of my state and in my role on the, in the other body where I had jurisdiction over the FBI, they are mainly a law enforcement agency. No matter what anyone wants to say publicly, they will be mainly a law enforcement agency. 90% of their work will be law enforcement. Right. Let's take the counterterrorism section of it and take a hard look at it and decide whether that's where it belongs. It, it may, it may not. Well, what about domestic intelligence, okay? We've traditionally, you know, the CIA, did intelligence work off our shores and for privacy concerns, uh, we really haven't had a domestic intelligence agency. And now the FBI, in light of these terror attacks, is assuming some of that responsibility. Um, it would seem to me that this new director of Homeland Security is not only going to need the input from the CIA, but he's going to need, he or she is going to need first-class input from somebody who is monitoring all of these potential terrorist groups within the United States. If I might take a couple of minutes to answer, it's a very profound question. The history is very interesting. In 1947 and 8, when the OSS was, was converted into the CIA, J. Edgar Hoover did not want any other agency of the United States government to have investigative and law enforcement authority 
and he was joined by the civil libertarians, which is a rather interesting combination. J. Edgar Hoover and the civil libertarians, they all agreed. They didn't want an interior ministry, if you will. So the counter-espionage efforts that the FBI had discharged with great distinction during World War II became, became counter-espionage from 1948 until very recently. A few years ago, they started getting into the counterterrorism business, and as you all know, there was a joint center of the FBI and the CIA and others that is a counterterrorism center. If you really want to look, you know, think out of the box, and I've talked about this with a number of people in both of those agencies, you might want to, not this year, I don't think, you want, want to look at the British example, MI6 and MI5, the Israeli example, in which they have Mossad and Shin Bet, one foreign, one domestic. The question is, do we want a first-class domestic security agency that deals in counterintelligence and counterterrorism? Now, some will say yes, some will say no, but that is a huge issue, and it's much bigger than we can, we can solve today, but there are ways to do it. Uh, Scotland Yard, for instance, doesn't have the responsibilities in counter-espionage and counter-terrorism, they have law enforcement responsibilities. The FBI now has both. And you're going to have to decide how you deal with that. This bill will not address that in any major way. Thank you, um, Ms. Sikowski. Thank you, Senator. Unlike you, I, I missed a good deal of the questioning. A number of us were meeting with Prime Minister Sharon about uh, security, among other things. Um, but so if I'm redundant in questions that were asked earlier, I hope you'll forgive me. Um, and I appreciate all of the wonderful work. I went to one of your briefings earlier, um, and I appreciate all the work that you've done for us. Yesterday's Washington Post had an article called Unintended Tasks Face New Security Agency. And let me just read the beginning. To hear President Bush tell that the new Department of Homeland Security will improve government's, quote, focus and effectiveness, unquote, but the confusion attending many aspects of his proposal suggests that government may be headed for a prolonged period of bureaucratic chaos before things are sorted out. Late last week, Agriculture Secretary Ann Veneman wondered whether she could define the parameters of legislation so that Congress would not transfer all of the animal plant inspection. You, you get the drift. And it seems similar to what you said about the FBI just now, that 90 percent is law enforcement and 10 percent other that might apply here. Um, I, in addition to wondering whether or not we aren't just in store for all of this bureaucratic, these bureaucratic issues, I'm wondering if this is, in fact, the time to do that, given the urgency of addressing our intelligence requirements, and if our focus then is shifted from perhaps where the most critical problems really are right now to things that are going to distract us from our capacity to connect the dots. So I want to address both the bureaucratic, the issues of bureaucracy and shifting it, but also the shift of focus. You, you mean that creating this new agency is shifting the focus from other things? Is that your question? What, what I'm saying is if what it seems to have emerged over the last couple weeks is that this has been an intelligence failure. And that when we talk about connecting the dots, that all the elements were really there that potentially could have prevented September 11th had the dots been connected. And so I'm wondering if for our first priority ought to be addressing those clear failures and then addressing what may be longer-term problems. No, I, I, I think you can do both. Uh, that's the, that's the, the, the magic of the Congress. You're divided into a committee structure which can deal with multiple problems at the same time and always has. This is a unique problem. Uh, this problem deals with border security, and it deals with those people who are securing our borders and responding to acts of terrorism and attempting to prevent other than the intelligence piece. This is why we recommended two and a half years ago that we go to this kind of a uh, this kind of an organization. Obviously, it's got a few more pieces to it, but it's essentially the same uh, the same directorates of prevention and protection and security. You know, the intelligence committees may well decide after they have finished their hearings uh, later this fall that they they need more hearings that they want to 
reorganize the intelligence community. They may want to do that. Uh, they may want to change it. Let me just add one thing. Uh, you know, I don't necessarily accept the conventional wisdom that what happened was totally an intelligence failure, but then that's because I probably have had had access to information over the years that, that is rather unique. Uh, there were some errors. Uh, I, I'm not sure that I would call that a massive intelligence failure, as some have been wont to call it. The problem we have, and anyone who you talk to in the intelligence communities will tell you this, is not that we don't have enough information. The problem is we have too much information. The question is, how do we analyze this data? Uh, and, and how do we do it? I mean, today we have millions of items of intelligence coming both electronically and from field reports from many agencies. How do we deal with all that? How do we make sure that back in 2000, the director of the CIA or his deputy knew about that meeting in Kuala Lumpur? Probably unlikely that would ever get up to that level. Why didn't it get to the FBI at the right level? Those questions have to be answered. But I must say that there's a lot more success between the FBI and the CIA than, than, than you ever hear about. They do a lot of great work together. Most recently, we read about what happened yesterday. So I'm not sure massive intelligence failure is, is necessarily the, the right answer, although many feel that way. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Putnam. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I thank the distinguished senator Senator, when, when your report said that America will become increasingly vulnerable to hostile attack on our homeland and our own military superiority will not protect us, when the commission that you participated in said that Americans will likely die on American soil, likely in large numbers, and that Americans are not as safe as, the, they, as they perceive themselves to be, you were called alarmist, cynical, a lone voice in the wilderness, uh, former elected officials taking advantage of the freedom of being away from office to propose radical changes that had they been in office would know that that was not possible. And my, how the worm has turned. Mm -hmm. We have a, a, an obligation to do our own consequence management in, within the institution of Congress to deal with this issue and within the executive branch to craft this new response mechanism. In addition to recommending the creation of an Office of Homeland Security, as the Hart Redmond Commission did, you also focused on the financial aspects of the war on terror, something that President Bush has also done. Do you believe that the administration proposal adequately transfers and focuses uh, the financial aspects of Homeland Security with the inclusion of Secret Service? or do you believe that it should go further? No, I, I, I think that they will have the use of the Secret Service, but I believe that the work will still be done by FBI and other people at Treasury. I think they've done an excellent job. I've talked to Secretary O'Neill. I know what they're doing on this. Much of it is classified, but I think it's a very important step, and I think the administration ought to be commended for recognizing that if you cut off that money, you would make it very difficult for some of this to take place. So, no, I think, I think they're doing very well in that area, and they should continue to do well. Has the Treasury Secretary been made a permanent part of the National Security Council, as was recommended? I don't know. Incidentally, that's an interesting point. I hope that the Homeland Security Director will be a member of the National Security Council. I hope the legislation contains that, because that person should be. He or she, whoever that director will be, the new cabinet secretary, ought to have the same seat at the NSC as the Secretary of Defense, because they are doing the identical thing in different places. To follow up on Ms. Schakowsky's point, uh, th there is some concern about the, the level of priority that will be given to the non-homeland security functions that will necessarily transfer with these agencies. The Coast Guard will still be expected to tend buoys, to cert conduct search and rescue missions, to assist uh, mariners in, in stress, in distress. Uh, the APHIS function that from USDA will still have certain responsibilities that, that aren't necessarily critical to the national security but are important current functions. You, you believe that they can do both? I do. Uh, as long as you don't change the statutes that give them their authority and responsibility, I am sure, to take the Coast Guard, for example, they will keep their 
organization just exactly as it is and expand it in the area of port security. Their major role will be port security and security of ships entering this country who could be carrying weapons of mass destruction. You know, one of the things we haven't talked a lot about here this morning, and no need to, but one of the principal parts of that report that you read from uh, uh, Mr. Putnam, uh, in fact, I think it's the paragraph at the very end or the very beginning of what you read, is our concern is not only for what happened on uh, September 11th. We have deep concerns about weapons of mass destruction. And uh, one of the figures in there, of course, deals with cargo containers, uh, 50,000 a day coming into this country, less than 1% being inspected a natural place for a weapon of mass destruction to be smuggled in the country. Coast Guard has a major responsibility in that area. And they are a great organization and they will discharge it well. What they need is to have total coordination by one person who runs that security apparatus. And we're going to have that if this legislation passes and that's why we fully support it. But if this legislation passes and we have a streamlined agency and we have perfect coordination and perfect communication and we improve our rate of, of inspection from 1%, let's say that we, we quintuple it, which would be a massive improvement at, in the government. We will still only be inspecting 5 to 6% of what's coming into this country. What are we leaving out in terms of research and development to devise techniques that allow us to improve our inspection? Well, I think it'll give you some uh, comfort to know that that is going on right now. There is a lot going on in the idea of electronically scanning a lot of this equipment as it comes off ships. In addition to that, there have been suggestions made by people who worked on, on our staff that there can be more overseas inspection done of cargo before it's sealed. There are a lot of things going on to try to make us safe. As I said, not perfect, but the goal ought to be perfection. I appreciate the... Uh Chairman's indulgence, and, and, and it, you, your last point was the most important, that in many of these cases, we need to catch them before they get into our ports. That's right. Because if it is a weapon of mass destruction, it's too late at that point. And there is substantial research going on and action going on. I don't want to talk about more than that, but I, I think that a lot of people have taken a lot of these recommendations to heart. You know, there were 250,000 copies of these printed. We had 249,500 copies left on September 10th. On September 12th, we had no copies left. So if anybody's interested in, in looking at this, the three reports, they can look at the website, Maintained Force by the Pentagon, which is www.nssg, National Security Study Group, .gov. Uh, there are a lot of Americans who have been calling in to find out how to read this report, and that's where they can read it. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentlelady from the District of Columbia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator, I'm, I'm not going to ask you questions about the nuts and bolts. It took September the 11th for the nuts and bolts that you had out there in the book you've just referred to to finally get the attention of, of the country and of the Congress. I'm going to try to take advantage of your vast experience and intelligence, uh, which combines with your understanding of what to do about it. There's been a lot of, we continue to have this, this guesswork about what's inevitable and what's not inevitable. Uh, one of, the, one of the notions that would inform me on the notions of inevitability, and I think I know you belong to the inevitability school, uh, but one of the, one of the uh, pieces of information that would help me understand uh, what could happen, uh, if you would, would be to clear up a question I have had for many years, all my years in Congress, even before I came to Congress, uh, and perhaps because my district is this district. I watched terrorism occur against the United States and our allies all across the globe, in Africa, uh, in the Middle East, and in Europe. And I said to myself all during those years, I remember saying it to myself in the 80s before I came to Congress, in the 90s since I've been in Congress, wow. Why isn't it happening here? Uh, my, my own guess, having no access to any information, was to, and I openly complimented the intelligence of the United States. I said to myself, I know that we're not taking any precautions here. The only thing that must be saving us is we must have 
wonderful intelligence. They're keeping these people from getting on planes. They're keeping these people from getting into our country. God bless them. I don't know what they're doing, but that, that was my only hypothesis. Now, I must ask you, what took it so long to get here? Was it that they were insufficiently organized? Uh, was it simply fortuitous? Was it accidental? Were we really good enough to keep it from coming here until it got here? I have absolutely no understanding, particularly given what we know now, you can just walk across the border and, and do what you have to do, and we were totally unprepared. Uh, I cannot understand why we were protected, if I may use that word very loosely, until September the 11th and would appreciate any, any notions in your, in your own experience that you, might, that you might offer. Well, I can give you an opinion, uh, and we did look at that issue and talk about it some in, I think, volume two of this report. Uh, the brief answer is that for many years, uh, the United States Intelligence Services, including the agency and the uh, FBI, were able to thwart a number of fairly low-level threats against this country. And one you will recall was uh, on the Millennium effort to sneak across the border, an Islamic fundamentalist, I believe, and his mission was to blow up the LA airport, and that was thwarted. And there have been many others. I can't talk about them publicly, but there have been. They have been thwarted in unique ways to the extent that the people never even got close to this country. What has happened is that there has been a movement in the world, mainly uh, amongst uh, you know very far you know out uh, Islamic fundamentalists who do not at all represent uh, what the beliefs of that religion are, who have distorted them totally, who have taken great umbrage at several things. Number one, they are totally opposed to U.S. foreign policy. Two, they have and equally. They are opposed to our culture, which comes into their countries in various ways, with our service men and women, and with our television, and with our literature, and so forth. And they are very offended by that. And, and third, uh, they have started to acquire the capacity to commit the kind of acts that you saw. Uh, that whole rise of that type of fundamentalist action, based on what we looked at and what I know, started to arise in the late 80s and built during the 90s. Uh, Afghanistan was a haven for Osama bin Laden. He was able to, uh, to uh, at will, uh, run a terrorist training organization there. Other terrorist training organizations known to us were in other places in the world. And over a six, eight, ten year period, they trained for a mission of terror. And obviously what we saw on September 11th was their was there the pinnacle of what they wanted. But I would point out to you that many people in this government were talking about what happened first to American servicemen in Germany when they were bombed in their discotheques and killed, they were targeted. And thereafter, we lost ambassadors in Islamabad and in Lebanon. And then we had the two American embassies in Africa blow up, and then we had the coal. And there were a lot of voices who were saying, it is moving this way, and people weren't listening. And my final response would be that, and you may agree or disagree, you know, we're a wonderful nation. We've got a lot of great qualities. We all pull together. This hearing today is remarkable, bipartisan uh, hearing, uh, both Senate and House involved. You'll get it done, and what you get done will be good, I have no doubt. But the fact is that we kind of, we kind of don't want to believe the worst. That's maybe part of the American psyche. We like to believe the best. We don't want to worry a great deal. Uh, we don't want to think about what's going to happen to us or our children. And it takes a horrible event like the one we saw to galvanize this country into action. And there are many points in our history, December 7th, 1941 being one, when the country totally flipped from being isolationist to saying this will not go unchallenged. And so I think it's a combination of all those things. Uh, the chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Otter, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Senator, thank you very much for being here. And uh, although I didn't get to hear your opening statement yeah. in its entirety, uh, I did get a chance to watch most of it uh, in the back room. You heard the exchange uh, earlier on 
as I saw you were sitting in the audience, uh, with panel one between uh, uh, my colleagues uh, Kucinich and Putnam relative to has there been a threat assessment? Has there been a set, uh, threat assessment in your estimation? There has been. As a matter of fact, that's what this Congress asked us to do. Uh, I think volumes one and two are the threat assessment. And based on the threat assessment, this is the roadmap for national security, reorganize the entire government in, in this area. You know, everybody's talking about the Homeland Security. There, there are only six of the 50 recommendations in this report uh, are aimed at, at that point. So I think we've done that. I would agree with you. And my uh, preliminary review of uh, all of the engagement that you had relative to the issues that you worked on, plus I might add uh, the Sterling Committee that worked on this with you, uh, co-chaired and uh, worked on the, it's obvious to me that there was one agenda and that agenda was national security. Absolutely. Uh, the other uh, the other question that I, I guess I have, do you think that this legislation satisfies the ongoing uh, threat to this nation, not from terrorism, but the re there's a reason that we have counterfeiting as part of uh, one of the agency's uh, responsibility. There's a reason that we have APHIS, as my colleague from Florida mentioned. There's a reason that we have uh, licensing and navigational procedures from the Coast Guard. And it goes on and on. Do you think that under the, under the present design that's being offered, uh, that we can continue with those equally important uh, missions of these agencies and at the same time increase that mission to include national, totally national security? Well, I do, and I'll, and I'll tell you why. The Coast Guard's a great example, and I'll come back to one of our recommendations. Coast Guard is obviously going to have its role expanded mightily because seaborne security is an important component. If you don't do that, you're ignoring something very important. The port security, people coming in from foreign countries, inspecting these ships, making sure they're not carrying what they ought not to carry. Uh, they can do that. Uh, and they are very much a law enforcement organization as well as a boat safety organization and a maritime safety organization. But I believe that their anti-terrorism role is going to expand. The fact is the Coast Guard will still be commanded by a commandant. They will do the same things they've been doing. They will probably have more money than they've had because they certainly need it. But they will have a cabinet secretary that's particularly concerned about the homeland security part of their, of their issue and will work on that with them. And so I think the answer is yes. Now, customs, we split it in our report, as you may, if you read it recently. We said that the Treasury ought to keep the revenue collection part of customs, which isn't very much anymore compared to what it was back in the old days when they were called revenue agents. But today, it's very different. They are mainly law enforcement in so many of their functions. So we did say separate. No reason you can't in certain instances, but it has to be clear divisional responsibility to do it. You couldn't do that with the Coast Guard. You know, today that cutter is doing boy work. Tomorrow it's out intercepting a tanker to see if it really contains fuel. Uh, I'm sure uh, you've watched with uh, some enthusiasm, uh, perhaps is a poor choice of words, but I'm sure it applies here. When we passed, uh, or when the Patriot Act uh, was passed, I and did. all that was embodied in that, and I was one of the members that voted against the Patriot Act because I saw a lot of inherent perils in the Patriot. It doesn't make any difference who's taken my freedom away from me, whether it's some foreign terrorist or my own government. Uh, but we extended law enforcement broad, expansive powers to, I think the number was 78 federal agencies. A lot of people operated under the impression that that went to the CIA, the FBI, and the NSA. Uh, not true, uh, because it stated law enforcement, federal law enforcement agent in there. And that includes the BLM and the bank examiners, and it goes on in finitum ad nauseum. Uh, do you think that this could be an opportunity if we created, through this legislation, an opportunity for us to go back to that 78, that group of 78 federal agencies and withdraw some of those broad expansions of power? Yeah, it wouldn't be a bad idea uh, to look at it. I'm not saying you ought to do it, but I will tell you this, that I always get concerned when you expand law enfor enforcement powers into agencies that haven't had them before. Many of them don't know how to handle it and haven't had the training to handle it. Now, maybe they're getting it. I must admit I'm not current on that subject, but certainly a good opportunity to look. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Chair now recognizes the gentleman from uh, Massachusetts, Mr. Cherney. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator, for coming in uh, again before this committee. Uh, you have come before to uh, carry the light and let us know that this was on the way, and uh, I wish that uh, Congress and, and two White Houses at least had, had listened. So thank you for uh, doing all the work with your commission that you've done and for continuing to come and testify. Let me ask you, will you just expand a little bit on the importance of having the position uh, of the Homeland Security uh, head uh, be a member of the Cabinet and be approved by the Senate, and the reasoning why the Commission went that way? I think as we move into the 21st century, in many ways, terrorism against the American people, against our homeland, will be as much an issue as will our Department of Defense and its issues involved with maintaining security and America's interests overseas. Uh, the threat to American citizens is very real. In fact, the threat to American citizens is more real than the threats that we have from some of the international situations we're involved in. I mean, American people are very concerned about Bosnia. They're very concerned about Al Qaeda. But they're not threatened personally by that. They are threatened very personally by events like September 11th. And I believe that when you have someone that is going to have the kind of responsibility that that will indicate, that person should, number one, have cabinet rank. And, you know, uh, in this town, titles do count. <laughs> Ought to have cabinet rank. And number two, I believe should be on the National Security Council. In the process of drawing your plan, you did bifurcate, say, the Customs Department for one. On the Coast Guard, do you have any concerns if the Coast Guard is taken in in its entirety into this new division? What's going to happen about uh, all their responsibilities with regard to the fisheries, rescues, things of that nature? Are we going to have to create another entity for that? Well, knowing where you come from, uh, I would suggest that to make sure that doesn't happen, that we are absolutely positive that all of those responsibilities statutorily are carried with them in whatever statute creates this, that there be language to incorporate their responsibilities. Because boating safety and safety for fishermen and helping boats in distress and all of those wonderful things that they do, and I am personally familiar with what they do off our New England coast, uh, extraordinarily important. I cannot believe that the Coast Guard will ignore those. What you've got to make sure is that they have enough funding to make sure they can do everything. Well, it was never a thought of mine that they would ignore it because, as you know, they've done very good at that. My, my concern is that when they get put into a division that's concentrating solely on national, homeland security, uh, that the pressures are on them, and, and whether they be budgetary or otherwise, to focus so much on that that they're not given the resources or the leeway uh, to do the rest of their job, which is so critical to uh, different parts of this country. Well, I think that's an important concern. I think it has to be addressed both by the appropriators and by the authorizing committees, and it should be. Uh, I think they can do it and do it well. Uh, you'd be interested that we talk to a lot of Coast Guard people high-ranking Coast Guard people, and officially they couldn't say too much, but they were not happy in the department they were in. Thank you. I thank you, uh, Senator Rudman, for your very valuable testimony to the committee, and I can assure you that we'll be working diligently on these matters in the weeks and months ahead. Uh, the committee uh, now uh, we'll stand in recess until 1 o'clock when the third panel will be called to testify. Did you want to add anything before we I only want to thank you for the opportunity and tell you that we have a number of people that work on our staff over that three and a half year period that would be delighted to be a resource to this committee at any time and any of the subjects that you've covered this morning. Thank you, sir. The uh, committee stands in recess till 1 o'clock. We'll have more from this hearing in just a moment, but first, some schedule information. The Joint House Government Reform Subcommittee hearing on the new Homeland Security Department continues next. After that, remarks from President Bush and congressional leaders after their White House meeting on Homeland Security. Tomorrow morning on Washington Journal, a look at federal estate taxes. Some members of Congress want to make last year's repeal of the tax permanent. 
We'll get opposing views from Jack Farris of the National Federation of Independent Business and Robert McIntyre of Citizens for Tax Justice. And then a roundtable discussion on hate crime.